getting started now. I'm going to hit the button and then we will uh, get going with this thing. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the stream. Um, yeah, let me just start this off with a real quick introduction of what we're going to do today, what's going on. We're going to go through the process of building out a somewhat of a dungeon defenders type game from scratch. We'll start with an empty project where I'm just going to pull in some art and we'll go through the process of writing that code to make the whole thing work, um, setting up enemies that walk along that we can kill, um, setting up player input, all of the types of things that you would expect to see in a game like this, in the, like a dungeon defenders type of game. It'll be our own little take on it. Um, we'll see how it goes as we're building it along and take some feedback from chat and everything too. see what everybody's got in mind or any cool ideas or recommendations people have. So I think we're just about ready to get started. Before we do though, make sure that you hit the subscribe button or at the very least, just hit the like button. It makes a huge difference and it really helps. And then uh, once we get going, um, I'll, I'll actually, you know what, let me just switch over to desktop mode and start talking about what we're gonna build, show what we're gonna use, what we're gonna build, and then talk about um, something else that's a little bit exciting and kind of cool that I, I wanna share. So let me switch over to our desktop mode real quick here. So hit the uh, button there. Just wanna make sure that I've got everything set up right. I think that's looking good. All right, so here's my empty project. And let me show you first the um, assets that we're gonna use so you can have an idea of what this game is gonna look like and how it's gonna play. And I haven't built it yet, so I don't have like a pre-working demo to show you. This is, should be a lot of fun though. All right, let's see. The assets that I'm gonna use here. Oh no, did I already close my page out for them? Give me one second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna load them right back up. So it's the uh, character bundle right here, this low poly character bundle. If you take a look at it, it's got like a nine or 14 different characters that are all low poly. And I, I'm going to grab a couple of them and use them in here. I've already got a couple of them imported in. And like I said earlier in the chat, if you have a request or one of these characters that you want to see in this game as one of the enemies that walks by or maybe as the player, I'm thinking that the player will be this little Anubis dude here. But um, if somebody, if you know, there's a consensus on something else, let me know. But if you have a recommendation or just a request on one of these to be in here, just type it in chat. Let me know if there's a bunch of something in there. I will use that one as well as the ones that I'm already using. Also, um, I, I got an extra code for this. So I wanted to use this pack and I bought it because I thought, hey, this is a neat one. But then I got an actual free code for it too. So I'm going to probably give that away during this stream. I think maybe once we hit like a thousand likes on the video, um, I'll just reveal it on the stream and whoever claims it first can get it first. I'll let you guys know before I do that though, so you don't have to like freak out or anything. If I end up doing that, I'll give you like a, a, a warning of a minute or two so you know what's going on. All right, um, looks like lots of talk about the eyeball and a bit about the skeleton coming in here. All right, cool. So we'll, I'll let that keep going and I'll pull them both in for now, I guess. And then we'll get into the, um, the asset pack that I'm using for the environment. And that's this uh, dungeon pack here. Let me find this one in the asset store too real quick. Just want to show everybody what I'm using. It's this Orin, let's, ah, did I spell it right? I got to spell the, uh, the name of it right. This is actually a free one too. So the, uh, the dungeon pack that I'm using is completely free if I can spell it right. Let's see, there we go, did I spell it right? Yep, and it's here, I'll pull it right over here this dungeon low poly pack. So it's totally free. And I think it's gonna work well as just a map. So what I'm thinking is I'll take a bunch of these blocks and line them up, make like a, a very simple environment at first where the players or the enemies can run across and maybe go you know, attack the enemy flag or the enemy crystal or the player's crystal and kill it to you know have a, something that we need to stop. And then we can set up traps. It's got all these little traps and things here. So we can put those down. We could put down towers and we could also run around and just kill the bad guys. All right, let's, um, I guess, get started with the video or the, uh, the process of doing this. So I already imported in the dungeon pack and I think a couple of the characters. I grabbed the mummy and the dragon and I'm gonna go to the package manager and grab that skeleton too. And the eyeball, because there was a lot of talk about both of those. So let's go into the package manager. I've got the skeleton here. I already grabbed it from the asset store and hit download right before we started this. So I'm just gonna import it and pull it in. And then, um, oh, I don't have the eyeball one already downloaded. So I'll grab the Medusa and then I'll grab the eyeball later. 
So let's import in the Medusa as well. I don't know which one of these I'm going to start with. Maybe I'll start with the skeleton since it had the most, uh, the most requests so far. So I've got a couple different art assets imported and zero code. We got nothing here at all. I'm going to write the code as we go. And then I put a link in the description where I'll just paste the code into a GitHub gist. So you can just follow along and copy it out of there if you want, or you can just kind of watch and copy my code as I write it. All right, so let's close this out and let's go take a look at the dungeon pack first. I'm going to go into the scenes folder and just look at their demo scene for one second. I just want to see what it looks like in here. Go select something and zoom around and all right, there we go. So it's a little map. It looks like a bunch of different blocks. Like each piece is a separate block. Each floor piece is a block, which might not be the most performant thing for us, but I don't think it's going to matter at all in this game. Um, and then it's got a different, a separate level up here and then a bunch of different props. And I think if I collapse this thing down, there's actually a whole section for floors and then other things. So I could even separate out the floor completely. I think, like I said, I just want to build out something simple at first and then, uh, kind of go from there. Like let's make a, a really simple NPC that just walks across the ground, goes and hits a target, and then we'll set up our ways or make it so we can build a more complicated map later. We don't need a super complex map. Now let's drag this out a little bit too, because I realize my window is not taking up all of my screen. Thanks for calling that out too, to get that sized up again. All right, in there completely. Got too, too many windows and too much stuff going on here. All right, I think that's closer. Perfect. Okay, so let's uh, make a new level here. Let's make a new scene where I can set up these blocks and set up an enemy. That's going to be the first step. So we'll go file and new scene. I won't save my changes there. And I'm just going to go into the prefabs here and let's see what it had for blocks. It's got floor pieces. So this is floor D1 or 01D and 02D. If I zoom in here with a control on the mouse wheel, you get a little bit of a preview there of the two. It looks like they're just the two different colors. So I'll drop one out here into the scene view and reset the position and hit F to go to it. I got one here at zero, zero, zero. And I think that these are two meters wide by two meters. I think they're two by two by two cubes and not one by ones. Let me double check that though by dropping out this other cube right next to it. I'll reset that position again. And then I'm going to turn on grid snapping mode right here. If you're not in a global mode, you can't do it. So you got to switch to global and then you can turn on grid snapping and it'll just snap over by unit. And yeah, like if you look at snaps, one here isn't enough. It's like halfway through the thing, but two is enough. So go to negative two and it's side by side. That's looking better. And now I've got that kind of checker mark or I have the two different colors so I can set up that checker mark. So I'm just going to select both of these. Oh, I don't want the directional light. I just select the two floor pieces. There we go. And control D and duplicate them. And I'll just drag them over here and let's uh, do that. I think I want to go like maybe 10 wide. So I'll duplicate it, duplicate it, duplicate it and get it to, ah, uh, let's go like 12 wide. Let's duplicate one more over here. Okay, so now I've got a straight little path and then I'm just gonna double the size of it. So I'll select them all, duplicate and move those dupes over here and then offset them by one spot and take this one here on the end and just move it over. So now I've got kind of a, a bigger fat road. Let's go to the game view though, because the game view is gonna be way off. And now I wanna set up, um, let's set up a player or actually let's set up a flag and an enemy first. Let's set up a, a target for the enemy to run to and an enemy have it start running across and killing our thing before we even give ourselves a player. So let's find an item that we can use for a flag. I think there's actually a flag included in this kit. If I look in the different teams, yep, there we go. Red one's got a flag. So I'll just take this red banner and drop it right out into the scene. The position's gonna be all messed up. So I'll reset it right here and then raise it up out of the ground. Go in down here. It's, remember it's right mouse and WASD. If you hold down right mouse, you can turn and WASD to move around if you're not if you're new to Unity or anything. All right, so on the X rotation here, I'm just gonna put in a 90 to flip it up to the correct orientation because it looked like it was offset by negative 90 there, and then move it over to somewhere that I think makes sense. Oh, that's not the right spot. Let's go to kind of like the middle there and up. There we go. That actually looks almost perfect. Now, if I go to my game view though, it's still gonna be weird because I'm like off to the side. I'm gonna move my camera up so that my game view kind of matches or what we really want to do is get my camera in a position so that my game view looks right and I'm thinking that uh well actually if I want to leave the orientation of my camera alone I think do I want to do that I think I am I'm going to leave the orientation of the camera alone and I'm just going to rotate the world around this a little bit the reason for that is just um 
really just to keep everything straight so that if I'm going backward and forward on my Z axis, I don't have to translate it if I'm not doing any rotation. I don't even know if I'm gonna need it, but I'm just gonna turn all this stuff around instead of moving the camera around. So to do that, I'm gonna create an empty game object here. I'll reset the position, name it environment, or actually I'm gonna name it floor. And then I'm gonna take all of the floor pieces, select them, make them children of it. And then I'll just move this thing over here and rotate it, hit E to, oh, whoops, wrong rotation. Let's switch to, um, there we go, center rotation, there we go. It's this little tool right here to do the rotate there. And I, I can just put in a 90, whoops, no, I can't do it that way. I have to actually drag it. Okay, let's see, can I get it to the right angle I want? Okay, let's undo that. Let's try again, so I'll hold control and now I'll drag it, there we go. There we go. The problem was that I started dragging it without control. I got a little bit of an offset in there and I really wanted to get this at negative 90 for all of these so that the whole thing was rotated. Now, if I look at my camera view, I can see that my camera is aimed right at it, which is closer to what I wanna have. I just now wanna move this camera up a little bit and then maybe tilt it downward. So grab it, move it up and tilt it down or even come over here, get it kind of lined up to where I want it to be. And with the camera selected, I can just hit um, Control, Shift and F that I move the object to my position and rotation right here. It just sets the transform of whatever object I have to match my scene views transform. And in fact, let me line that up a little bit better and then move that banner here, hit W and get it kind of over here as an end point. Is that actually in the ground or is it floating up above? Hard to tell. Looks like it's in the ground. All right, so there we go. I've got a little piece of ground here and I can set up an enemy here and make him walk over there. And I think that that's the, um, the first part, right? That would just be, the, the thing that we need to, yeah, I guess have as an enemy or something that we need to kill, a target or a bad guy to kill. Let's save this law off as a scene. I'll go into my scenes folder and let's call this um, dungeon one. And then we'll create an enemy. So we've got a level. Um, let's make a bad guy and make the bad guy start walking. So go into the infinity PBR folder and let's expand it out real quick. So we've got the Medusa, the mummy, the skeleton, and the dragon. Um, I think we're gonna go with the skeleton first since that was the most requested one. But let's take a look at how this works real quick because there's actually some really cool stuff on the skeleton so we can really customize it and make it look kind of cool. Let's go into the prefabs folder here and just double click on the prefab and open it up. Oh, what, did it open up my prefab? What, what did I do there? Oh, I'm in the game view. Sorry, I had my game view set up and I, I completely mixed myself up. So here we got the, um, the actually, you know, I'm gonna get out of that. I'm gonna go out of prefab mode. I'm just gonna drop this guy out into the scene. Drop him right out here and go to him. And then let's go select him. If we go in here, um, oh, that's right. This is uh, not the one I'm thinking of, is it? Give me one second. I'm just trying to think this through. What did I have in, I, did, cause I didn't play with this guy. Let me, put, let me pull out the uh, mummy real quick. Mummy is the one that I did play with. I don't remember where the, um... oh, that's right, it was in here, sorry. Okay, so if we'll, we'll open up the demo scene. Let me save my dungeon real quick and open up the demo scene for the uh, skeleton real quick and hit play. This is what I wanted to show, but oh, there's an error in here. I'm guessing the error is with um, some asset pack that isn't in here. Let's just clear that out, wardrobe manager.cs. Um, where's file at? I'm just gonna delete that because I don't know what it is or why it's causing a compile error. I assume it's gonna mess with clothing or something on one of these, these guys. All right, so go to the game view and here we can actually see the character. Well, it's not, ro why isn't it rotating? There we go, can we rotate it? Am I hitting a comp an error? What's going on? All right, my UI is total. Oh, I'm not. Yeah, it's not playing. Sorry, everybody. Acting crazy. Apparently, my thing is not playing because something else is referencing this wardrobe manager. I should have probably not just deleted it, and I should have. Um. Oh, yeah, I I should have just let it work. <laughs> I should have fixed the issue here. Let's see. Let's go back and fix it real quick. So. It's saying that the skeleton demo is erroring out because I deleted my wardrobe manager. I'm gonna go re-import this package real quick. So go back to the package manager, go back to that skeleton and import it. Sometimes this happens and I pull stuff in and break things and I'm not paying enough attention. That's what happens when you don't pay attention like, like I wasn't doing right there. In fact, I probably should have made sure that, let me double check that everything is getting imported there. Yeah, it looks like everything's there. All right, so let's hit play again, see if I have an error. 
if I don't have an error, look at that. I don't know what I did. Somehow I totally messed it up for no reason. So I'm going to close this because I don't have the environment. I don't care about the environment so much, though. I just want to see this guy in action. So I'm going to hit maximize on play, pause it, and unpause it again so you guys can see it full size. And I'll hit maybe later on the review. And then let's go through some of the options here. So this is the reason that I wanted to use this pack. Not just because it's got a bunch of animations and stuff set up that I can use, which I think will be kind of cool. Like I can make this dude just attack or get hit or whatever, or like collapse and die. It looks like he's got some reassemble stuff. But this stuff over here, let's um, here, re reset yourself. Go back to walking. And then let's go through these texture sets. So I can swap out the different sword and armor here. You can see you've got a bunch of different variations here. I can swap out the different skeleton textures here. But I can also just go down here and hit this randomize button. And this is the part I like. And just hit this and just get totally different variations of it constantly. So I don't have to go in there and try to make a bunch of them because I'm a terrible artist and uh, yeah, I would never make anything that looks really cool or cool variations on stuff. And if I can just hit a button to do it, I think that works a lot better. So you can see it kind of modifies the different parts of the shape and then um, also swaps out the different armor pieces here. And it works like that for all of these different characters, which is why I wanted to use them in the first place. All right, so let's take this little skeleton dude, drop him into the scene and make him actually play and do something. Is looking at art is fun, but it's not fun for very long. All right, so we got a warrior here, and I want to make this dude just uh, walk across and go attack the the flag over here. So I'm going to move this dude, get him right over to the edge, and um, I'm going to go to the game view just to make sure he looks about the right size. I think that seems okay. I'm going to crank up the directional light too because I feel like this is a little bit dark. Put this up maybe like a 1.5 so I can see it pretty well. All right, so make this dude walk across i'm just going to use some simple navigation we'll just set up a nav mesh and make him use the, the nav mesh system so i'm going to create an empty game object to hold the model for this enemy so that the art sub piece of it is kind of a child of it that way if i want to swap things out later it's really easy to do and i don't have a bunch of things kind of built on top of this prefab so just create an empty one i'll write or drag it out of here rename it to empty or no enemy that empty in fact, let's, let's name it Skeleton. S-K-E-L-E-T-O-N. There we go. And then I'll take the skeleton and drop it under. The only reason I made it a child is just to get the position right so that this thing would be at the same position as that one. I could have also just copied its original position. Now I've got my skeleton here. I'm going to go back to scene view. Hit F. Let's add a nav mesh agent. So just go nav mesh agent. And that pretty much just automatically sets up, right? I don't really have to do much here, except for maybe fix this position because the Y position was just a little bit below the ground. And I think it looked a little bit strange. Now, I don't like the Y position right here is at one. So I'm going to move my floor down because these things are two meters high and I put them at uh, zero there. It looks like they're, they're offset. They're going up to one. And normally they would be up at like 0.5. If I just move it down by um, down to negative one, I guess, here, type in the negative one. I should be able to put this guy down to zero and then have him zeroed out on his position. There's no real technical reason for that. I just felt like it It, it seems better to me. All right, now I'm going to make the ground navigatable so we can make this dude actually move along it. So we we'll just select the static box over here. And let me just drag this over to the side. If I click on here, you'll see there's a navigation static option. I just need to check that and hit yes to change children. That'll make it so that all of these little floor tiles here have the navigation static option checked and that'll make it so that they actually get included in the navigation mesh system so to generate our nav mesh we'll go to window and then go to i think it's under what ai now and then navigation and then go to the bake section here these are actually little tabs here object also lets you check whether or not something's navigation static and see it's on for that floor piece i'll go to the bake tab hit bake and i get this little blue outline here this weird little blue outline i don't know why it's a uh, chopping up so much and acting weird but that outline is the navigation mesh for my character seems like the something weird going on with this uh collider oh these things don't have colliders so i'm going to select all of these floor components and we're going to add box colliders to them that's an issue there so i'm going to put box colliders on them and then i'm going to go regenerate my nav mesh let's rebake that okay wait what happened there so when i baked my nav mesh it should have baked on the colliders and not the uh, the renders. I'm not sure what happened there, if it did or not. But it certainly looks a little bit weird. Actually, let me just move the floor down and I'll see what the nav mesh looks like. Okay, it looks fine. It's just clipping through here and looking a little bit strange. So I'll move it back up. 
But you can see here, let me move this down a little bit. But what you see here is this blue line is essentially where this nav mesh agent is going to work, think is walkable anywhere on this blue plane. Even if I move the ground after I bake this stuff, it's still going to move there. In fact, let's leave it down here for a second. We'll make him run around and move on it, and then I'll fix the ground so that it's actually in the right position. So you can see how that works. So I'm going to go to the skeleton now, and I think it's time to um, write some code. We got to make some code that's going to make him run over and attack our little banner here. It's at the end of our nav mesh. Remember, if I go to navigation system, it's it's there kind of at the end of it. So let's uh, let's do this by creating a scripts folder. We'll go to the assets folder. Go we'll right click and create a new folder called scripts. I got to spell it right. S C R I P T S. I'm gonna go into here. And I'm just going to make an enemy script. So here, create C sharp script named enemy with a capital E at the beginning. And then we'll open it up in Visual Studio. Now, while that opens up in Visual Studio, um, if you don't mind hitting the like button and the share button, I'd appreciate it, I guess. <laughs> and then we'll uh, get to writing code. So the enemy, what does it need to do? It needs to tell its nav mesh agent to walk to um, our flag. That's the only thing I really want it to do at the start. So I'm going to get rid of all of this. Let's add an on enable and we'll say get component. Let's zoom this in too, because no reason for it to be small. We only really need to do one thing. We'll get the nav mesh agent. I need to hit alt enter and add the using statement to add that using unity engine.ai. In fact, I can get rid of these other two using statements up here. So get the nav mesh agent and we'll do a dot set destination. So we can do this on the next line or that same line and we'll set the destination to the position of our enemy flag or our flag. So I'll say flag position. Now I don't have a flag position, so I'm just gonna generate that one line above. So I'll say vector three, flag position equals, and I do, let's do a game object that find one really, really ugly call and everybody can hate it, but I'm gonna do one by name and it'll be totally fine because we're gonna change it later. I'll say game object dot find, and we'll just put in the name target with a capital T. All right, so we're gonna look for the target and we're gonna use its transform dot position. Oh, not, not PS, it's transform dot position. So say transform dot position. And we'll move that semicolon up here and look at this. So now we're gonna get the position of our target and set that as our destination. Super, super simple. So now I just can go in here, assign this to my skeleton and watch it not work. Watch, go ahead, attach it to the guy I hit play and I should see a nice little error message saying that it's null or an object reference has not been set. That's just because we didn't set up a target. So we'll go back into unity and stop playing and just rename our banner to target save and hit play. Now I expect that. Well, let's see. There's no nav mesh agent attached to the warrior object. Okay. Let's check that out. So let's go to the warrior the skeleton. Ah, yep. I wait. Oh no, I put the, what did I put the nav mesh on? Or the script on? I put the script on the child here instead of on the parent that had the nav mesh agent. So I'm just gonna take it, select this one, click and drag it right up to the parent and that should fix it. So I can select the child, looks good. The parent now has the script. Hit play one more time. And look at that, he just runs right over to it. Even though, like I said, the ground has been moved because the nav mesh was baked when it was up there, it still counts and it still uses that as the nav mesh. Let's move the ground up. Oops, not that one. I want to move the whole floor up, take the whole floor, put it back into position so that it doesn't look weird anymore. Was it at negative one? I guess that's about right. Or let's just type in a negative one exactly and go back to the nav window. There we go. So now I've got an enemy that walks right over to the, uh, I guess the enemy flag. Um, I want to make him animate real quick and then we'll make it so he attacks. And make him do a little walk animation, uh, which should be really simple, and then make him start attacking the flag, and then we'll start putting in ways to kill the guy and uh, defend ourselves. You know, we gotta have some kind of defense, I guess. All right, so our skeleton here probably has an animator on him. Let's see, yep, he's got an animator with no controller, but he does have an avatar set up. Let's just go make a controller for him. So I'm gonna go to the assets folder, right click, hit create, and make an animation folder. And then we'll make a really simple animation controller for our enemy that just handles walking right now. So it'll just do walk and then we'll expand it later. Go so right click, create an animation controller, name it enemy. 
and then assign it to the skeleton. So take it and just drop, oh, not here. Assign it right down here to the skeleton and drop it in. Now, I might wanna have different animation controllers for different enemy types, but right now I've only got one, so no real reason to, uh, to complicate it. So let's double click on the controller, open up the animator controller, and set up an animation for it. So I wanna take this animator and just drag it up here out of the way so that I can find an animation and drop it onto here. And this is gonna be one of those skeleton animations and I'm looking for the walk animation. So let's make this a list view. Oops, go to the correct folder, go to that skeleton warrior folder, go to the model folder. And if I expand out the model, I should see the animations underneath it is my guess. Yep, there we go. There's a walk, a walk backward, a taunt, an idle bunch of other things. I'm just gonna take walk and drop it out there because right now it just needs to walk forward, doesn't need to ever stop or do anything else. So that should be enough, right? Now, if I go to my character here, let's go to the scene view. He's got the controller on it. The controller's got the walk on it. If I take my animator, drop it down here, I should be able to even just watch him animate and watch the animation play. Let's see. There we go. He's walking, he's animating, looking pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. Um, I want to slow his speed down just a little bit because he walks a little fast. I'm going to put him at maybe like a, a 2.5 instead of a 3.5, which is the default there because I think the, the skeleton should go a little bit slower. In fact, I might slow him down a little bit more even. Let's take it out of uh, maximize on play mode and then I'll turn this down to like a 2 and then hit play and then I can just adjust it at runtime. So I can just take the speed value and slow it down or speed it up a little bit. So if I want to make him like a... Yeah, I think that's closer to what I want, like a 1.3, maybe 1 1.4. I want, I want the enemies to walk relatively slow. There we go, so I think I'll go with that, like a 1.4. So stop playing, put in a 1.4 and save it off. So now we've got an enemy that walks over there and animate. Actually, let's watch what happens when he gets all the way to the end while I uh, crack open a rock star real quick. So let him walk to the end and see what he does when he reaches the end, because that's, I think, our next piece to hit. See if I can if I can get this thing open. All right, yep, and there you go. See, he just kind of like he stands there and he just keeps walking. So that's about what I would expect. He's reached his position, but there's nothing in the code that says, "Hey, stop animating your walk." So let's make him stop animating his walk and then start to do an attack. Attack this thing, kill it, and then we'll make a way to kill him. All right, so we'll stop playing. And let's go, well, first let's just set up the animation real quick. We'll make an idle animation in here. So I'll take the animator, drag it up there. I still have his character model selected and expanded out. So I'll just take the idle and drop it into here. And then I'm also gonna take the attack. Let's take just attack one and drop it in there as well. So I've got an idle and an attack animation. I'm gonna take the attack and just kind of drag it up here. And then I think it's alt and, yep, alt and left click to drag and pan around here. So just alt and left click on the back there to drag it around. And I wanna add in, um, two parameters. I think I'll just add a bool for whether or not he should walk and a trigger for whether or not he should, or when he should attack. So I'll add a bool and I'll just call this walk. And then we'll add a trigger and I'll call this attack. So the trigger for attack will happen from any state. So I'll just right click on any state, go into the attack, make the transition there. So I right clicked and hit make transition, clicked on attack to actually create the transition. Now I click on the arrow, which is the transition between them. I don't want has exit time checked. And I do want a condition that makes sure that I've done the attack trigger. So check that. And now whenever I do an attack, it'll go into play this attack. Now I want to go from the attack back into the idle animation. So I'm going to move this. Actually, here, let's just take the walk, drag it down a bit and put the idle in the middle. I'll make a transition from attack down to idle. So after the attack plays, it goes to idle. Then I'll make a transition from idle to walk and put in a condition. So select the transition here, add a condition. And we'll just, yep, there we go. Walk true. That was the default one. I don't have to change anything. I do want to uncheck has exit time because I don't want it to wait and blend those animations. I'll make another transition back up from walk to idle. Same thing, right click and hit create or make transition, then click on idle. Then we'll go to it again, add the condition and make the walk false and uncheck has exit time. So now we've got a set of animations or a way that we can toggle through these animations. I'm going to play through them real quick, make sure that it works before we set up code. It's always good to kind of like get these things working, make sure that it works when you click the box before you write the code, because if you messed something up in here and it's not working right, you don't want to be trying to debug the code like thinking that it's a problem in the code when it's really just something in the animator. All right, so there he goes. He's 
in his walk animation, so far nothing seems right at all, right? So, okay, he's trying to play an idle and it's not working. So click to walk and that works. Idle doesn't seem to work. The attack, okay, it seems to work. Okay, let me, let me try this one more time. Let's hit play again and let's watch him right from the start. So he might be doing something. What I'm not sure on is whether or not he's playing the idle just once and not, not looping it or if he's just never playing the idle. So let's go take a look real quick. We'll go to the uh, project view, go select the idle and just hit play. Yeah, that idle right here, let's see if I expand it out, it's very easy to miss. So it'd be very easy to not notice it if it is happening. So I'm gonna close that back out, let it snap back down there. And I'm just gonna go make sure that this thing's actually set up to loop. So go select the character up here. Here, I'll just click and hit left and go select the base one. And I'm gonna go down to the idle animation. Oh, loop time is on. So he is set up to animate and loop it. I don't know why he's not looping it then. Let's see. Let's double check that he's not looping it. So go back to the animator. Got the idle animation right here. Let's just hit play. Oh, you know what? I think he actually is animating. Let me go to the scene view. Zoom in a little bit and play. Back to the scene view. Yeah, turn off the nav mesh agent. There we go. Now we can actually see it. Problem is he's moving while he was animating. So it looked like he wasn't animating and his, his idle animation is super, super, super chill. So it's really hard to see it. But you can see he's animating there. And if I switch over to the walk mode, he starts to play his walk animation. Not actually moving because I turned the nav mesh agent off. And if I hit attack, I'll go into an attack. He'll go through idle and instantly go into walk. So he doesn't actually stay in the idle. He just kind of snaps right through that into the walk state. So that looks like our animator is set up right and good to go. I'm gonna actually write the code now. So we've got our enemy script here and our enemy script just needs to deal with what animation to play. So the first thing is, I guess, setting whether or not we should be walking based on what our nav mesh agent's speed is and then setting whether or not we should attack based on whether or not it's time for us to attack. So let's make an update. We'll add, right here, add in an update method. Scroll in or scroll down and zoom in a little bit. Get rid of the extra private keyword here. And let's say, well, actually, let's cache our animator first. So I'm going to go up to the top here and I'll add an awake and I'll say underscore animator equals get component in children because the animator was a child component. So I'll get the animator here. And then we'll cache that or generate a field for it. So hit home, alt enter, and generate a field. Get rid of these private keywords just to shorten things up. Alt enter to turn this into an expression body method to just shrink it down since it's only one line. And then I'll copy this and oh, let's delete that private keyword too. There we go. So I've got my animator now cached in awake so I can use it in update. In update, I'll just say animator.setBool and I'll pass in walk the name of our Boolean there. And we'll set it to either true or false based on what our nav mesh agent's velocity is. So um, well, we don't have our nav mesh agent cached. So I'm gonna cache the nav mesh agent. I'll copy this little bit of code here and I'll turn my awake back into a block method and say hey underscore nav mesh agent equals paste in our get component call now we're going to cache both of those that's how quickly sometimes you have to change things like you think you need it one way and then you change it back the other way it's easy to do though with the shortcuts once you get used to it and get really fast with just hitting alt enter and the shortcuts to go back and forth it can save you a ton of time just and keep your code clean while you're writing it so I've got the nav mesh agent now let's zoom out a little bit so everybody can see the full script there's really not much to it yet and once this file is done, I will put it into the uh, gist that's uh, on the, in the link right below. So you better go grab it in just a few minutes once this is done with the first version of it. So we're gonna set this to either true or false based on whether or not our nav mesh agent is moving. So I'll just copy my nav mesh agent here and I say nav mesh agent dot velocity dot magnitude greater than zero. That's really all I need. Let's zoom in a little bit. Now, obviously this isn't the most performant thing that I could speed this up and cache it or just change it only when I needed to, but it doesn't make any difference here. What we're doing is just setting walk to true or false based on whether or not our character is moving. It's not gonna impact us at all. The other thing that I wanna do is set the attack whenever we wanna do an attack. So let's, um, first let's play this, make sure that the walk thing works and let's do the attack because the attack is, a little bit more complicated, not very much. We just have to have a timer and to check to see if we're in range and then we switch to an attack. So 
watch the dude walk. I'll take a drink and everybody can hit the like button while I do that. All right, he's almost there. Come on. He got to the end and he switched to an idol. Perfect. That's about what we expected, right? At least that's what I was expecting. He would get to the end and uh, be ready to attack, but not quite attacking. So we'll write some code now to make him attack. All right, in our update method, I think we could just say if we're ready to attack, we should perform an attack and then make him play an animation and do an attack. So we'll write in a little bit of code here in update. We'll say if ready to attack and make that a method. We'll generate it in just a minute, then attack. Pretty simple. At least that's the flow. And this is a lot of uh, what we have to do when we're writing code, right? Just think through the, the idea and the flow of how you want the thing to work. Type it out, write out those methods, and then fill them out. Like once you've got it kind of stubbed out, just start writing the code. So here, I don't know if I'm ready to attack, I want to attack. That's it. I don't know exactly what those are going to look like, but we'll figure it out. So ready to attack should be, I think, pretty simple. I just want to have it on a timer and know like if I'm close enough to my target and my timer is up, I should be able to attack. So first, let's uh, add in a check for our target. Let's cache our target here so that we can see what our distance to our target is. So here we've got our flag position. Let's just make this into a variable that we save off. So I'm gonna rename it to underscore flag position. I'll get rid of the declaration there, hit alt enter and generate a field for it. Now it'll just be saved off. In fact, let's uh, shrink this down. Let's get these into one liners now. I think I was gonna put more there, but there's really not more to put, so I don't need to. So here we'll cache the flag position and we'll set our destination. And then here in the attack, We'll check to see if we're in range to attack. So we'll say, back, or let's say float distance to target. And let's scroll that up a little bit. Equals, and we'll use vector3.distance. This will get us the distance between two positions. And we use our transform.position. So this is our current skeleton or enemy's position. And then our flag position. That's it. So this will just return us a distance in meters from between these two points. And we'll just check to say, hey, if distance to target is greater than attack distance, then um, return false. Oh, and I just realized I'm doing this in the wrong spot because this is part of my, am I ready to attack check, not part of my attacking code. So I'm gonna take this bit of code, cut it with control X. So I select it all, control X and control V to paste it. It's also just command X or command V if you're on a Mac. So now I've got the code here for my ready to attack that will fail out or return false if I'm out of my attack distance. Attack distance doesn't exist yet though, and this method's not complete, so we have two errors. So let's generate attack distance, hit alt enter, and generate a field for it. It's the default option right there for me. That'll create it and get rid of the error, but it's not actually gonna fix the problem. I need to hit F12, and then go actually set up a distance. I'm gonna make the attack distance equal to like two meters for now, and I'm gonna make this a serialized field. There we go, serialized field instead of just a private field so that I can modify it in the inspector. Also gonna get rid of this extra private keyword just because I don't need it. Then we'll go down here and check our ready to attack. So if we're out of range, we are not ready to attack. The other thing we wanna check is if it's um, not time yet. So if our time isn't met, then we should not attack either. So we'll say if time.time .time is less than next attack time, return false. And then if neither one of those are the case, then we'll just return true. And of course we could rewrite and rearrange this in a bunch of different ways and re re restructure this, but it needs to do essentially this. We need to make sure that we're in time and that we're in distance. So we need to generate a next attack time. I'll hit alt enter and generate a variable for it, which should give me a float. If I hit F12, there we go. I've got a float for it. This is not going to be a serialized field. I'm going to cut it and move it right up here so that it's aligned with my other non-serialized private fields. And then we'll just set up this attack time. So whenever we attack, our next attack time will be the current time plus whatever our attack delay is. So we're gonna need an attack delay. So let's copy line 12, paste it right here and replace distance with delay. This will be the amount of time in between each attack. I'm gonna leave it at two, why not? Actually, no, let's turn it up to three just so that the numbers don't exactly match. And then let's go down to our part where we attack. So actually, let's take a look at the whole thing and then let's figure out the attack and then I'll upload the code real quick and take another drink while we watch it in action. So right now we have our four fields that we're caching, our two serialized fields that we're gonna see in the inspector in a second. We're caching the animator and the nav mesh agent. 
in the enable, we're caching the flag position, and then we're getting our nav mesh agent and just telling it to go to that position. We don't tell it to ever switch targets right now. Maybe we'll do that later, but right now we don't need to. So we just say, hey, go to that destination. In fact, hey, look at this. Nav mesh agent right here could actually replace this get component call. Let's see, I'll zoom in real quick just so everybody can see that. That nav mesh agent was already cached and awake. No reason to get it again. All right, we'll zoom back out. The update just updates our animator's walk state and checks to see if we're ready to attack and then performs an attack if we are. Get rid of these private keywords that we don't need and then let's make the attack work. So for the attack, what do we want to do? Well, we want to set our next attack time equal to time.time .time plus our attack delay. Whoops, not our nav mesh agent, our attack delay. So this will make it so that we can only attack every three seconds or whatever our delay is. And then we want to, well, let's first just play the animation. We'll say, Animator dot set trigger attack. Oh, we've got to put it in quotes. There we go, and save that off. So now you should just run up, play the attack animation once he's in range. I'm gonna hit play. We're gonna watch it in action. Oh, there we go. We got our two new fields. Watch the bad guy do his thing. I'll take a drink real quick, and then see what happens. All right, walking over. <clears throat> All right, and he's at the flag and he stops, but he is not attacking. Why isn't he attacking? Well, let's take a look. So he's never going into the attack. If I click the attack, I can see him play it. So he's never actually setting that attack trigger. Let's go to the console. I don't see anything here. Let's turn up his attack distance. I wonder if the distance is too high. Yep, that's the problem. So the issue there is that he thinks he's farther than three meters away. Now, I think that the reason for this, if I just go over here and select one of these objects here, let's go select the skeleton. So here's the skeleton and his base point. So the center of the skeleton is like his position. That's where he's actually at. Um, or wait, no, am I on the wrong thing? No, here's his actual position. I was like, I had select center selected. I needed to be on pivot. The pivot or the bottom, the feet, which is much better. I was a little bit worried for a second is where his actual position is at. So that's where he's supposed to be. But if I select my flag or the target, and we hit W, you can see here that the pivot for this thing is way up in the sky. So the distance between these two things is way greater than three. What I need to do is, well, first I need to pull this thing down so that it's in the right spot. But I also need to set the base of it to be the actual position or the key object or the, the primary object. So I'm going to stop playing. We're going to right click on the target. I'm going to hit create empty. I'm going to make an object that's right down here at the base. Um, in fact, let's make a cube. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to right click and hit 3D object and create a cube. And then I'm going to make that cube down here at the base. So that this object is going to be kind of the, uh, the home object or the, the position of it. And I'm just using a cube so that I can see it very easily or so that everybody can see it. I take this out, drag it to be a sibling of the target, and then make the target a child of it. Rename the cube to target, and rename target to banner red, because I think that's what it was. It was a red banner. Now that the target is the actual base level object, you see that it's down here, and I can use this position. So all I need to do now is, well, actually, I don't think I need to do anything except for turn off the renderer and the collider there, and then get this thing down into the correct position. There we go. Now that it's in the right spot, I should be able to save, hit play, and watch it work. Remember, because I named the object target, just looking for an object named target, it should just go right over to it. Okay, you know, somebody was asking if you can change the pivot point of a game object. Um, you can't do it just in Unity. Well, actually, there might be some way to do it in Unity you, without um, parenting it, though. So you can just reparent it underneath something. That's usually what I do. You can also just do it in your art tools if you're good with... Uh, Blender or any other art tool, it's something you can definitely do. All right, so here we go. This guy is now walking up to the flag and attacking it. I think he's getting a little bit close to it though. Um, where's his stopping distance? Right now his stopping distance is set to zero. I'm gonna crank that to like a 1.5 and then grab him and just move him over here a little bit and see what happens. If he, there we go. So now he's stopping at 1.5 meters out. That's what this stopping distance is here on the nav mesh. So now he's actually stopping I think at a range that makes sense. It should be greater or less than his attack distance, but not right up on the object. Cause I don't want him to stop right on top of it. So I'm gonna stop playing. I'm gonna put his stopping distance at 1.5 again while it's not playing and save it off. And then I think, um, oh, well, 
We need to make it actually kill the flag real quick, and then we'll make the enemy killable. Actually, you know what? Uh, let's uh, let's put this up for a vote. Does everybody want to make the enemy kill the flag, or make it so that we can kill the enemy first? Um, go ahead and vote in chat real quick, and I will pull out some milk duds while you do that, and ask everybody to hit the like button that hasn't hit it already, or if you have hit it, um, share the thing instead. All right. So yeah, you guys want to see um the enemy kill the flag, or do you want to make a way for a player to come in and start killing an enemy? <laughs> Good stuff. All right. I'm seeing lots of votes for killing the flag first, so I guess that'll be the uh, first step. So let's do that. Let's go into our project. Ooh, those make me thirsty. We go to our scripts folder. Actually, let's upload the. Um, I want to get that enemy script uploaded real quick, so that everybody can use it. So let's go up here. I'm gonna paste it into chat, or not into chat, into the uh, the gist file that's linked there. Let's see. All right, edit this. Let's go back to edit mode. Edit. Add a file. Enemy. Cs and paste it. And now you can go grab it in the link in the description. All right, so let's set up our script now for the flag. So I'll right click, hit create and make a C sharp script. And we'll say flag. And don't worry if you want to see the enemy die, that's coming next. We're going to do the enemy, make him go launching off with a uh, ragdoll physics and stuff, maybe make him like launch off the edge or something and die. We'll, we'll do some cool stuff to kill them all. But first we'll make it so that we have a reason to kill him, I guess. So we have some pressure. All right, so we've got a flag script. I'm going to put that on my target here, assign it, and then um, let's see how we want to set this up. I guess the flag could just have some health. It could take a hit every time we attack, and whenever it takes some number of hits, it dies. Seems simple enough. Let's zoom out here. We'll add in a health amount. So I had a serialized field for health, or let's call this a uh, max health. Int max health, and I'll assign it to like 10, so it can take 10 hits. And I'll, I know I'm going to need a current health, so I'll say int health. And then we'll add an on enable. On enable, we'll just set our health to our max health. And then let's see, what else do we want to do? We want to have a way to take damage or to take a hit. So I'll add a public void take hit. And I'll take a damage amount, so int amount. And then uh, let's call it take damage. Take damage. I'll have an int for an amount, and we'll say health minus equals the amount and then if health is less than equal to zero then we die and then dying right now i just generate this let's make dying just uh reload our current scene for now so say uh scene manager dot load scene zero and we'll add a using statement for it. so when we die it's going to be annoying it's going to reload our scene um i think that's about it so we'll load yeah okay now all we need to do is set up our take damage. So we'll go to the enemy and say, hey, whenever the enemy does an attack, tell the flag to take damage. That means that we should probably cache a flag instead of a position now. So I'm gonna change this flag position from a vector three to a flag, not a flag, a flag. We'll remove the word position, remove the word position. We'll get, uh, let's do a find object of type and we'll make it of type flag. So we'll change, instead of getting the target, we're gonna find a flag and we'll cache that thing. And then we'll just go to the flags position. In fact, I can just put a dot there. Look at that. Oh no, I right, can't. Yeah. Transform dot position. Totally lied to you there. All right, so now we've got, oh, we can get rid of that though. Now we have a flag that's cached instead of the position. And when we do our attack, we can just say, hey, Right here, let's do the animator set trigger and then do flag dot take damage and we'll just take a damage amount. And let's give the, our enemy a damage. So we'll say damage. Uh, let's call it attack damage. There we go. And then we'll generate a field for attack damage. Now our, oops, that is not what I wanted to do. I hit F, I hit alt enter too, and enter too quick. So hit F12. I go in here, you'll see that I accidentally generated a, a method that took in an object of attack damage instead of generating a field for attack damage. So I'm gonna go back here, Alt-Enter, and I wanna hit Generate Fields. Yeah, I did generate a method, messed it up. 
hit the wrong one. Sometimes that happens. Fix it. There we go. Hit F12. Go up here. I've got my attack damage. I'll copy serialized build and paste it over private. And I'll just assign it as a value of one for now. So my first and my default enemies will do one damage. All right. We'll go in here and uh, see, is there anything else I need to do? Let me think. I think that that is probably it. Oh, no, we have an error. So let's check out the error. So hit clear. Got an error saying the flag position doesn't exist. Ah, okay. Flag dot transform dot position. Oops, there, key. there we go. There's one spot where we were referencing the flag position variable that we renamed to the flag or changed and hadn't updated it. All right, let's go back in here. Hit play one more time. And come on. You should come over there, attack our flag, and kill it in a couple hits. And I should be able to just turn up his damage in a second. Let's see uh, how much damage he's doing, though. Or see if he actually does damage to this thing and kills it. In fact, I've got the target selected. I'm going to switch to debug mode here so we can watch the health value. There we go. It's at 9, 8. We're going to go to 7. There we go. It looks like it's counting down. All right, looks like it's working. I think it's almost done. Oh, I know it's almost done because I can count, but you get the idea, right? All right, let me eat one more milk, Dad. Take a drink and uh, I beg everybody to hit like and share the video one more time. Oh, look, and it reloaded. All right. Um, I think it's time. I think it's time to kill the uh the bad guys, right? Time to make them go launching off the edge and stuff. Let's do that. Let's set up a player character. All right, so we're gonna go. Let's see. I don't know which player character I want to go with. I am going to let's see. Pull in a couple of them. Let's pull out a couple and then see what everybody wants to use. So I'm going to take out this, uh, let's see, what does this Medusa look like? Drop her out. Um, maybe not the serpent version of her. I'll take the human version of her. That looks usable. Or I could go with um, maybe the mummy. Or the other guy that I was considering was the Anubis one. Um, let me go pull that in too. And I guess that, well, let me pull up the Anubis and the mummy and the the uh, Medusa right here. And then we'll see what everybody wants to use. We'll go with whichever one you guys want to see as our player character. We'll make that the character. And then we'll uh, start killing some zombies and stuff. Um, oh, there he is. Anubis right here. Okay. Or killing some skeletons, I guess they are. All right. So we've got a character set up. Let's see. Oh, no. We've got it imported. No, we're talking about it. Set up. All right. So. Where is he? Where's our Anubis? Let's grab him into the models folder. Just take this Anubis dude. No, not that one. Let's go into the prefabs folder. We'll just take this Anubis dude and drop him out. All right, so I'm gonna use one of these two, I think, as our character. Which one do you guys wanna see? Go ahead and pick. Just uh, vote really quick in chat which one you wanna see. If you wanna see the Anubis dude or the Medusa be the player character, and then we'll just set that one up. We'll make him run around. We'll make him knock the skeletons off and Make those dudes go ragdolling and flying and everything else. So if anybody's got a preference, uh, vote now or yeah, we're good. Or I'll just pick. But it looks like there's already people in there voting. So we'll give it a couple more seconds and see what everybody says. By the way, once we get up to, I guess, a thousand likes, I'm going to just put up the code here. So somebody, whoever is quick, can grab the, uh, the asset pack that I'm using here for all of these characters, like 14 of them. They're pretty freaking cool. Um. All right, well, let's do watching the chat now. Oh, it's a little bit contentious on which one to go with now. I don't know. Okay. Um, hmm. I'm going to let the voting go until I finish uh, eating this milk dead real quick, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Oh, okay. Now I'll take a drink, and uh, it looks like I think we probably have a winner here. Yeah, a a Anubis seems to have won by uh, probably a two or three to one vote here. So we'll go with him first. Um, anybody, you know, obviously, if you're following along and you're copying this, you can just go grab Medusa, pull it in, and try it too. Um, or maybe we'll get to it and have time to 
put him in as well. So let's set up this Anubis dude. Um, oh, he's got a script on him that it can't be loaded, whatever. I'm going to remove it because I don't care about that. I don't want a script on there. I just want the character set up and want him running around animating. Actually, I'm going to switch to debug or out of debug to normal mode too. All right, so now I've got, uh, <laughs> voting for Milk Dead. All right. Now I've got my Anubis set up, and I think that the way that I want to do this guy is going to be very similar to the, the skeleton. I'll set up a parent object that will have a nav mesh agent, and then we'll just use like a click to move style system, and then if I click on the enemies, it'll kill them. I was thinking about maybe going with the PlayStation controller, but I've done that quite a few times recently, and if anybody wants to know how to move with the controller, it's very easy to adjust it or adapt. So I think I'm going to go with a click to move setup for him. So I'll right click on here on the Anubis dude, hit create empty, and we'll make this player. And I'll drag it out and make Anubis a child of it. Again, just to get this thing positioned exactly where Anubis was. Then I'll go on to the Anubis player, or and now it's player, not Anubis. And we'll add the nav mesh agent. That should, there we go, line up right around our player and make it so he can move on the navigation mesh. Now we'll create a script for our player. So I'm gonna go into my scenes folder, or not my scenes folder, why'd I go into there? I wanna go into the scripts folder. And let's right click and just create a player script. Player. In fact, you know what? Before I do that though, I'm gonna update the enemy and the flag scripts into that just real quick so that everybody who's following along can grab these two scripts. They're both very, very small and very simple. And if anybody is curious what it looks like, it's essentially just like this, just this little, just where you can grab the files and copy them right out. And this is a site I love using. I use it all the time. And I, I highly recommend people get used to using it to share files. This or something like it. So here, I'll paste in the flag right there. Update it. Oh, and I want to hit add file. I meant to do that. Oh, actually, no, I don't need to add a file. I've got the enemy. I've got the flag. I need to update the enemy, though. So let's go to update. Go to the enemy. Copy that. And I'm just going to paste it in here and paste and update it. All right, anybody following along now has the latest code. All right, so let's set up that player script. We'll go back into the player script. And here, what I wanna do is check to see if the player clicks. So if we click anywhere on the nav mesh or on the ground, I just wanna to move to that point. And then if we click on an enemy, I wanna make them attack the enemy eventually. First, let's do the movement though. We'll set up some really simple movement in our update. I guess I can get rid of start here. I don't think I need it yet. I'll get rid of these two using statements and just zoom in and start filling out our update method. All right. So we want to check to see if we are, um, or if we've left click first. So say if input dot get mouse button down zero, that's left click. Uh, right click is just mouse button one. So if we've left clicked, then we want to just see if we've clicked to somewhere that's on the nav mesh. So we want to do a ray cast into the scene. So I'm going to use the physics system. So say, uh, actually, what do I want to do? I want to say int hits equals physics, P-H-Y-S-I-C-S, -S, dot raycast non-alloc. So I want to do the non-allocating raycast. I could also just do raycast, but the non-allocating one is generally better to use in most cases and probably a good habit for people to get into. And I need to give it a ray. So I'm just going to put in the word ray because I don't want to shove this all into one line. And then the results. So I'll say underscore results. This will do a ray cast, giving a ray. I give it a ray, and then it's going to fill up an array of results and give me back the number of things that it hit. So first, I need to generate a ray. So I'll well generate a local for it. It says ray ray equals default. I'm going to use camera dot main dot screen point to ray, and we'll pass in our input dot mouse position. This just gets us a ray into the game or into the scene using our main camera. Obviously I should cache this camera, but for now I'm gonna just leave it as is and then we'll change it as we go. So we're getting a ray here. And I say obviously, the reason is just that this is a, it, it's generally considered a bad practice to call camera.main in code that gets called often all the time if performance matters. Here performance doesn't matter because we're not doing anything else. And it's just because it's a slightly slower call than caching it. All right, so. We're, we're getting our array. That's the first parameter into the array cast non-alloc. The other thing that we need is this array of results. So I need to generate a field for it because th the reason that we use the non-alloc one is that it actually creates this set of memory where it's going to put the results and then it just reuses that set of memory so that we don't allocate memory. That's why it's non-alloc. So it's not allocating memory essentially so you don't end up with garbage collection or garbage allocations that you don't need. And get rid of that keyword though. 
and we need to allocate it once manually because we're not allocating it automatically. We're just going to allocate it once at the creation of our player. So say equals new array cast hit array. And we'll just give it a size of like 100. We could hit up to 100 things. Any more than that, we're going to have a problem. We're never going anywhere near that. So I don't think it matters. All right. So now we've got our hits array. Let's scroll down and let's see what we want to do. We want to just check to see if one of these hits um, is on the ground and we're able to set our nav mesh to go to that position. So we'll say four and hit tab a couple times, which will give us a for loop. We'll go from zero to hits, which is our number of hits or number of things that our ray intersected with. Because it could have intersected with one thing. Most of the time it probably will, but it could intersect with like 10 things if we have a bunch of props stacked up, enemies and other things. So we're gonna go through all of our hits and then we're gonna see if um, any of them have a point that works as a nav mesh destination. So our player is gonna to wanna to set its nav mesh agent's destination. I'm first gonna cache our nav mesh agent. Actually, you know what? Let's just write the code and then we'll cache it. So we'll say um, if nav mesh agent dot set destination destination. I, I think I definitely spelled destination wrong. So I'm gonna create the nav mesh agent so I don't have to learn how to spell. Let's go up here and we'll add an awake and we'll say underscore nav mesh agent equals get component nav mesh agent. And then we'll add the using statement for the nav mesh agent and generate the field. Okay, now I can get rid of that private keyword, go down here and let it auto complete my set destination. There we go. So now if the set destination call on our now cached nav mesh agent fails, so well, first we need to give it a destination. So what's the destination gonna be? It's gonna be hits at i dot point. I believe that's right, right? Oh, not hit, sorry, results. Results at i dot point. Remember results is a ray cast hit array. So it's a collection of ray cast hits. We're gonna loop through all of them. Most of the time it's just gonna go through. It's gonna be one of them. It's gonna look at hits zero, which is the only one that we have. It's gonna look at that point, set that as our destination. And this is going to return true or false depending on whether or not it can calculate a path to that point. So if it can't return that point, so or, or let's say if it can, so let's say it's able to set that as the destination, then we can just break out of this loop because we don't care. We don't need to do anything else. Um, in fact, we could probably just return, right? So I think breaking out is probably good though. Breaking will just stop the loop and stop trying to set the destination to anything else. That should, um, I think that should do it. That should move our player to wherever we click. Very simple, click the move script. Let's zoom out real quick. Let everybody get a quick peek of what it looks like and then uh, go try it out. So jump in here and hit play. Oh, we've got an error message. What did I miss? Miss something. Uh, here, clear on the console. Oh no, something in the wardrobe manager. What is this error? I don't know what's going on in here. Why this is giving me an error. I'm not sure. I'm going to uh, comment this out and bug Andrew about it later. I don't, I don't feel like debugging and figuring out wardrobe stuff that um, I don't need to worry about. I think it's just from having that character out in the scene and something else going on. I'll figure that out later though. Let's uh, hit play now and see if it actually works though. Now I should be able to click. Oh, come on. Oh, an animation event, not a problem. Okay, go to the game view and click. And oh no, what's happening? So nothing's moving. I think it's because I didn't put the script onto the player. Oh, or because I'm in, not in play mode. Probably both of those things. So let's uh, stop playing. I'm gonna uncheck the error pause. The reason that I'm getting an error here is just that there's an animation event on some animation here that's set up and not hooked up. It's not a big deal. It's just something that I probably need to rip out of an animation that I probably don't want playing. So let's, um, let's go add the script to our player and make him so he actually moves. So here's our player. You see that he did, did have the nav mesh agent, but he didn't have the player script. This is usually what happens when I'm playing and I have scripts that just don't work. It's usually that they're not actually attached. So I click, there we go, look at that, he moves and he just kind of goes to wherever I click. I can click all the way over there. I can click on the enemy and it'll still click through and go to the ground, even though I clicked right on an enemy because it's doing that where that iteration where it says, hey, the enemy is not a valid target. So it then goes on to the next thing that's below it, which was the ground. 
All right, so look good. I can move to the enemies. Um, now I think I need to make him either animate or make him attack and knock them off. You guys want to see the player animate first, or do you want to see him do the attack and uh, knock the enemy back? Go ahead and uh, just vote in chat real quick. I'll take a quick drink and everybody could hit like real quick while I do that. <sighs> Good stuff. All right. Um, and uncheck error pause. And we'll go take a look and I'll just wait while everybody votes and start thinking about what we're going to do here. So we either make this dude start walking around, which is pretty, pretty simple, or uh, make him knock. Actually, you know, I'm going to make him start walking around before anybody even votes. Watch this. So we can make him walk just by in our update saying, hey, animator dot set bool walk comma nav mesh agent dot velocity dot magnitude greater than zero. Then we copy the animator part here. Animator equals get component and children. I like how everybody voted for attack. So we're gonna do that by the time uh by the time everybody is done voting, we will be on to attacking. That's how quick setting up the animator is. That's it. That's all the code we need for the animator. Then it's just a matter of making an animator controller form. So let's make our animator do the attack and <laughs> and the, uh, the walk. Because we're going to need them both in our animation. So let's set up the attack animation. All right. We'll go into here and we're going to create a... Well, do we need... Let's think about it for a second. For our animator controller... Um, we really just need an attack and an idle and a walk, right? We don't really need to change that up. We don't need to have like a different flow for our player, right? We um we want to have walking and we want to have attacking. I don't think we need anything else. So I'm going to try this. We're going to try using an animator override controller. And then we'll see if we can just go that route instead of setting up a separate animator. If not, then we'll set up a separate animator. But this might be useful for anybody who hasn't used an animator override controller. Sorry about the vote thing. I was just too funny i saw all of the attacks come in after i was like all right i just gotta code this this walk up real quick because it's so simple and then the votes came in that's the delay of it of the youtube stream right all right so right click create i'm going to choose animator override controller what this will let me do is use that same animator but swap out the animations i'm going to call this player i'm going to rename enemy to character or actually i'm going to rename it to humanoid because it's a very simple humanoid type of animation. And then I'm going to make the player override that one. So I'll take the humanoid one that used to be enemy a second ago and just drag it in there. Now you see that when I have the player selected, it shows me the three original animations on there. So let me set it up real quick without overriding them. Put them on the player and then watch it. And then we'll switch it up so that it actually plays his, his correct animation. So I'm going to go select the player. And we'll just take the player controller here. Oh, I need to actually select the one with the animator, the child here. We'll take the player and just assign that right there. Oh, you know what I want to do is just uh, remove this blind shape manager. Let's remove that component because I don't need it right now. I don't want to customize this guy. I'm just going to use it the way it is. All right. Now, if I save and hit play, let's watch what Anubis does. Oh, he just kind of acts weird and bugs out, right? The problem here is that he's trying to play the skeleton's animation, which doesn't work. He needs to play his own animations because these aren't retargeted humanoid animations. So to do that, we'll just go over to our animator controller or the override controller right here. This player one. I'm going to hit the lock button to just lock it. And then I'm going to go into the Anubis folder. Go find that character and expand it out. And then I'll just take his walk, the Anubis walk, assign it to walk here on the player. And then I'll assign the um, attack one to attack one. And then I'll take the idle wherever that is it's in alphabetical order so i don't know why i'm having a hard time finding it um does he not have just a standing idle let me see oh guard idle that's probably it i'll take that and assign it there and then as i think about this because this is really tied to that character model type i'm going to actually rename this and i'm going to rename this from player to anubis and i'm going to rename the humanoid to skeleton I think that it's better if I just name them to match what the actual animations are. Now I should be able to hit play and see the same exact behavior on my Anubis dude. So if I go select Anubis here, go select the player, go to my animator window, you can see that I have the same controller here. It's just swapping out the animations, but I can switch them to a, let's see, go select him, switch him to a walk state. Let's see. Isn't it? Oh, isn't switching to walk because the code's already doing that. 
Can I switch him to walk by just clicking around and making him walk? He's acting really, really strange. We'll have to fix that. Some root motion offsetting going on. And I can also, oh, here, let's stop playing, hit play one more time, and make him attack, and then we'll go fix him up real quick. So here we go. We hit attack, and you can see the attack works as well. So let's fix up that root motion movement. Actually, let's hit play, watch what was happening real quick, and see why, why it's broken, and then how we can fix it. So I'm going to unlock the window here. I'm going to stop this real quick, turn the skeleton off, go back to the player with it unlocked and the player selected. Um, I'm going to select actually the child here. Look at the little child object here and I'll put the game view and the scene view side by side. So if I click and move this, let's see what's happening. Watch as the character moves. Look at the Z position here on the child and look at the player. So the player object is here, but the character is actually moved off. The reason for that is that apply root motion is on and we're using the nav mesh agent to move it. So the animator is also moving the character on top of the navigator or the navigation system moving the character. Then you just stop playing, uncheck that box, and I should make sure that it's unchecked. Yeah, it is unchecked on the skeleton warrior. It just happens to be checked on that one. So that's why he was moving all weird. Let's hit play one more time, run back over there and see if we can go attack that skeleton or get over to the skeleton. So there we go, I can run over to him. I can kind of block him and almost stop him from getting getting to the flag, but I can't quite attack him yet. So that'll be our next step is setting it up so that he attacks and plays an animation that makes the dude go launching and maybe kills the skeleton so he can't attack our base and kill us. All right, let's do that now. Let's make it so that he um, attacks and I guess uh, just kills, kills that skeleton. So um, let's see, how do I want to do this? Let's think about it. Do you guys, uh, this one, uh, I'm going to let everybody vote this time and I'm going to count your votes and we'll, we'll go from there. So do you guys want to have the enemy um, just like play a death animation and fall down and kind of fade away? Or do you want to have them go to like a, a rag doll and just go flying off the edge kind of down away and then they just poof after they've um, ragdolled for a little while? Go ahead and uh, just vote in chat and I will wait for your votes and we'll go with whichever one you guys prefer. And once we're over 500 likes there um, and we have the votes in, we will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the one that you guys want to see. So we'll either animate them or ragdoll them and knock them off the edge. Go ahead and pick and let me know which one you want to see. And then also hit that like button. And I will take another drink while we do that. Okay, some animate ragdolls, 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 ragdolls. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of uh, a lot of ragdoll stuff. Um, the assets that I'm using should be in the description. They're also right at the uh, beginning of the video too. If not, I'll make sure that they're in there. But they should both be in there. And if we get up to a thousand likes, I was just gonna give away a code for this uh character here too. So if we can just get a bunch of people to just share the video, hit like and stuff, and subscribe. Get there quick. Okay, so it looks like, yeah, we're definitely going with ragdolls. It's there's ragdoll, ragdoll everywhere. So let's do that. Let's set up a ragdoll for our skeleton. Now, anybody that's not familiar with a, a ragdoll, it's essentially just a system where you can kind of turn the character into a, like a doll that you could toss and the body flails and flops around, right? It looks kind of like a realistic body going launch. Not a super realistic, but like a doll body going launching, right? So to set it up, it's actually extremely easy. A lot of people don't know that there's actually a system built into Unity to kind of automatically generate them. There's a ragdoll generator. I'm going to go to select the skeleton here and choose game object. And I want to choose 3D object and choose ragdoll. This pops up the little create ragdoll editor where I can expand out the skeleton here. So I'm going to hold alt and click on the skeleton part. This is the skeleton. The other part was the, the mesh there. I'm going to clap that down a little and maybe drag this over. And we just need to assign all of the different pieces here. We need to make sure that I assign the correct pieces. So I'll make sure that I can see my character in the scene view too. So I'm going to go up here and we'll start with the pelvis and just drag the pelvis right over. And I want to click on it too and just make sure that it's right. Sometimes bones aren't named exactly correctly. Um, in this case, I expect that they will be, but it's always good to just click on them and check to make sure. So now I've got the, let's see, left hips. So if I click on that, human thigh. I expect that that's going to be the hip. Yeah, that looks like the hip. So I'll just assign that as the hip. Then I want the knee. So it looks like if I click on the this one right here, left calf, that looks like the knee. So I'll just assign that as the knee. And then the foot is probably the foot. Yep, there we go. 
So I'll sign that. Now I'm going to collapse the left side and do the same for the right side. So I'll take the right hips, which is that one right there, and then the right knee. Just double check it. Yep. And then the right foot. Double check that one as well. Yep. Looks good. So now we're halfway done. We'll just go into the spine and we'll, we need to get, let's see, we've got head, a middle spine, and then elbows and arms. So let's find the middle spine. Let's see, that's um, uh, maybe, where, let's see, where's the spine piece that's up higher? I guess that's probably about the, the middle of the spine, right about here. I'll take this piece right here and assign that as the middle. And then let's find the head and the arm. So we need a, let's see, a left arm and a left elbow. Here we've got, let's see, left collarbone. Not what I wanted. I, I really want that left um, shoulder area right there. So I got the upper arm. And then the lower one is the elbow. Got it selected. You can see the forearm. It's going to go into left elbow. Do exact same thing for right. And then I think we're pretty much done. So we'll go into the, let's see, that's left, left. Um, where's right? Left collarbone. Oh, here, we got neck and head. And so let's get the head. Assign the head. Collapse that down. We'll get the right hand side. We got right upper arm and right elbow. All right, looks good. I think everything's selected. I can click through and see all the pieces. I'm just double check real quick. Everything looks good. Right, 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 left, left, and left. And then I'll hit the create button and watch what happens. So it looks like everything just broke. A window went away and I got absolutely nothing, right? But if I collapse this down, you see that, um, let's see, did it actually create my ragdoll? Where's my ragdoll? Oh, it should have created my ragdoll. Let's see. I don't see it though. Let's see. Uh, let's search in here. It did. Where did it put it? Where is it as a chat? Oh, it actually assigned it. Ah, okay. So it actually set it up on my character. That's fine. So what, what happened here was that it, it created the ragdoll on my existing character instead of creating a new copy. I was thinking it was going to create a new copy because it used to do that. It looks like now it just created its, its own... um or it really set it up on the existing character, which is totally fine. So if you look here, I've got a rigid body now on the pelvis, and I've got a bunch of different colliders as I expand things out. If I save and hit play, let's just watch what happens. I expect he's probably just gonna walk along and animate, yeah. He just kinda walks along and animates as normal, but watch if I stop playing, and I'm gonna here, uncheck the, here, actually let's take the game view, make it side by side, go to the skeleton, Check it out if you're ready to see him ragdoll. I'm gonna uncheck his animator and then I'm going to unpause. Bam, and look at that, he acts all weird. So what's actually happening is the animator stops him from ragdolling because it moves his bones around. It you know controls exactly the position and rotation of each of his bones. When we turn that off, the ragdoll mode just kind of kicks in. So the body parts all fall with collision um, and, and the joints are set up so that you see the little arms and stuff fall down and flap around. But we also have the nav mesh agent dragging it along. So the thing starts to act really, really weird. So what we want to do now is set up some code so that we can make this guy die and actually go launching with it. So I want to turn off his animator and make him start ragdolling and flying away. So I'm going to stop playing and then we'll go over to our skeleton. And I think for the for this code, we just want to have like a a way for our enemy to die like make a public die method on him that makes his nav mesh agent turn off and he'll just go flying back and ragdoll we'll start that way and then we'll make it so that the player can do that death thing to the to the actual enemy so i'll open up the enemy and let's add in a method for dying and then we'll add a context menu to just excuse me to cheat killing him so i'm going to do that um let's do it right down here at the bottom and we'll say public void die I'll zoom in a bunch and we'll add a context menu item. And I'll just call it die. So this will be something that we'll be able to right click on on the component. Wait, oh no, it's I think it's context menu, right? All right, context menu, right click and then we can die. So what's the die gonna do? It's gonna turn off the nav mesh agent. So we'll say nav mesh agent dot enabled equals false. And then we just wanna add some force to all of our rigid bodies, or maybe add some velocity and launch our whole body in a direction. So I want to get all of the rigid bodies on this enemy and then just set their velocity to maybe like up and backward for our player. So let's uh, get all of our rigid bodies. We'll say bar rigid bodies 
equals get components in children because remember we have multiple rigid bodies now if i can find the right one get components the plural one in children of type rigid body to get us all of our rigid bodies in an array let's say for each far rigid body or let's say rb in rigid bodies let's say rb dot velocity equals underscore or let's call it no underscore launch velocity then I just need to create a vector for my launch velocity. And I'm thinking that that's going to be my transform back plus my transform up. So just like back and upward at like a 45 degree angle. So I'll just copy this. I'll say var launch velocity equals transform dot back or transform dot forward, negative transform dot forward, really, um, plus transform dot up. So that'll be our backwards plus our upward. Um, I think that's probably good. I might need to adjust the velocity and maybe give it some more depth power, but that should make it at least launch backwards. Now, obviously, I probably want to launch like from the direction of the player or something when we're doing a real hit, but I think that for our quick debug hit, this should work. Let's try it out. So hit play, right click, hit die, and uh, what happened there? Okay, so the nav mesh agent stopped. And the velocity probably applied, but remember, I didn't turn the animator off. So we need to turn that off as well. So let's go in here and say animator dot enabled equals false. All right, let's take a real quick peek at that die code one more time, do the whole thing, and then we'll go back into Unity and try it one more time. All right, we're in. I'll go select that skeleton, right click, tell him to die. Bam, and he died. And look at that, he just kind of fell backwards. So he didn't launch backwards very hard, but he just did kind of die and fall backwards. Which is pretty much the behavior that I want. I just want him to be launching a little bit further. So I'm going to go in here and let's adjust that launch velocity. Let's call it, let's um, add in a launch um, power so that we can maybe adjust it on the enemy and then maybe we could pass it in later or something. Uh, I'm going to go up here and we'll just add a serialized field for launch power. I'll copy one of these floats paste it right down here and we'll replace this second attack delay with launch power and then I'll scroll down here and just multiply our launch velocity times that so we'll take our launch velocity and go launch velocity star equals oops launch power so we can multiply it and power it up a little bit so the guy will go flying a little bit harder let's try that play on a right click on him and watch him die bam he goes flying off the edge all right i think that's looking a little bit better all right now i want to make it so that our player can actually do it so we'll run around we'll click on him our player will attack and then it'll launch the enemy um in the direction that we attack so let's i guess set that up we'll go into our player code let's go to our player script and right now our player doesn't have an attack right so our player just has an update that checks to see if we should move around and then sets a destination. So let's make it so that we can, um, well, attack by clicking on an enemy. So we don't just look for destinations that are on the ground, but we look for destinations that are on, well, no, targets that move around as well. So I want to make a way to cache our target. Oh, thanks for the super chat, by the way. Oh, and it looks like there was a question about right clicking on a function. That is with the attribute. I've added an attribute here, this context menu one. It allows you to right click on things and call methods. It's great for debugging, coding, and testing things out. All right, so let's go through setting up a way to set a target and lock onto it. I want to add in an enemy field here for our player that could be like our current target. And then we'll set that if we've clicked on it. In fact, let's do that. Let's do the setting code first and then we'll generate the field for it. So when we loop through our current hits, right now we do a raycast into the screen, see where we clicked. We look to see if um, any of the spots are valid destinations. First, I want to check to see if any of the spots are enemies. So instead of doing this call here where we loop through, I want to loop through all of the enemies first, see if there are some, and then set a target. And if there aren't any, then fall back to selecting a ground position. So I'm going to take this little chunk of code here from 25 to 29, hit Alt Enter, and extract the method and say um, set ground target. So this will try to set a ground target. In fact, I'm going to re rename it to try set ground target. I want it to try to set a ground target if, if it's able to. But the thing I want to do before that is try to set an enemy target. So I'll say try set enemy target and I'll pass in hits here, generate a, a method for that. And I'm going to do the same thing in it. So 
what I want to do is look here to see if I can set an enemy. And if not, then I'll set a ground target instead. So I'm going to say when we loop through try set enemy target or to, to implement this, I want to loop through all of my hits, see if any of them are enemies. And then if one is set it as the target and then return true. I'm going to copy this line here that does the loop, paste it right here. And then I'll add in some braces and we'll get the object with a get component or we'll get the enemy component if it exists. So say var enemy equals and we want results at i. So remember this is just like the code down here where we look at results at i dot point. We say results at i dot get component. Nope. Dot collider dot get component. Not in parent though. Here, I'll get that autocomplete. And we want to get the enemy component. So this will get an enemy from the thing if it has an enemy, if we click on the ground, it's going to be null. So we'll say if enemy is not equal to null, then underscore target equals enemy. And I'm going to add braces here because I want to do two things. I want to set our target to the enemy. So this would be like how we select an enemy. We've clicked on it. We got that component. It wasn't null. That's our target. We also want to return true because we want to return that we were able to get a target. Now, I want to wrap up that loop or the, the statement there. And then I want to say, hey, if we didn't get a target, so if we went through all of our hits, we didn't find one, we'll return false. And I get two errors or three errors now once that finishes. One is that target doesn't exist. So I'll hit Alt Enter and just generate a field for it. We'll take a look at that in a second. The other is that return doesn't work because our method is returning void or our return type is void. I'm going to change this to a bool though, so we can return true or false, get rid of the extra private keyword. And then we can go up here and use that true or false value. So now when we try to set the enemy target, if it gets a target, we don't want to set a, try to set a ground target. So say if try to set enemy target is equal to true, or actually let's say if try set enemy target, then return. That's easy enough. Then we just won't do the code after it. We could all say like if it's false, then try to set the ground target. But I think that that's good enough. That'll work. That'll set our enemy target. The other thing I want to do is when we set a ground target, if we do find a ground target, I want to clear our, our or we set, find like a ground destination. I want to clear our enemy target so that we're not having two things set at the same time. So I'm going to delete that private keyword again and just add in a little line here right before the break. And we'll say target equals null to so just clear out our targets. That way, if we did have a target and we clicked on the ground, we're clearing out our target and moving to the ground instead. So I think that's enough to set up a target, but that's not enough to actually move us to the target, right? If I run this right now, it's going to run, it's going to move, set a target in our data, but it's not going to move to it. Um, so we're going to need to make that happen. In fact, let's just go try it out real quick. I'll hit play. We'll look at it in debug mode and you see exactly what I'm talking about. So I hit play. I'm going to go to debug mode here in the inspector, just this little drop down. And then watch when I click on the enemy there. I clicked on him. Oh, actually, it didn't even set him as a target. Let's stop playing and see why. Let's go select the skeleton. And if you look at him, the part that has the enemy script on it, right now I'm in debug mode, so it looks a little bit weird. But the part that has the enemy script doesn't actually have a collider. So if I try to click on him, I might click on some of these little colliders, but the get component call isn't going to get the enemy because our enemy isn't at that level of those colliders. So I have a couple options here. I could either add a collider to this guy, which is probably the right way to go. Or I could go into this code here and just check to say, when we try to set an enemy target, let's expand this out. When we get the component for an enemy, we could just do a get component in parent, which I think I actually undid when it auto completed that way. But this will make it so that it scans up that hierarchy. So even if I click on one of these colliders that's underneath it, one of these ragdoll colliders, that's a child of it, it should select all the way up to the enemy. Let's hit play and see if that actually works. So I'll hit play, go click on the enemy. Oh, I can't see the guy. So I'm going to pause, go back to debug mode, select our player and look at our target. Our target right now is set to skeleton. I'll stop playing, hit play again. Watch, it should be none. And I click on the ground, it stays at none. But I click on the enemy. If I can get him selected. Okay, I thought I would be able to click on him and get it selected. It was selected, right? Oh, okay, well, I had him selected for a second there. I think you may have seen it. So yeah, I am able to kind of click on him. I don't like the way that that feels. Though. So I'm going to put a big collider on him and make it a little bit easier to use. So I'll hit add component and we'll just add a capsule collider. And then let's see. Oh, look, I'm on the wrong object. I'll right click and remove that. 
I'm going to go out of debug mode to normal mode, go to the skeleton, add a capsule collider for real. We'll move it up just by moving the center up to one and then set the height to two. Make it a nice, big, tall capsule. It's kind of hard to see it because it's got all these other colliders on him, but those are all little tiny things. And the other one, the big one is nav mesh agent, which isn't the thing I can click on. I'm going to check the is trigger box because I don't want this guy colliding with stuff. Hit play and let's try it one more time. The get component in parent call should work fine for this. So it should be selecting. Actually, I need to stop playing. Go select my player. Go back to debug mode one last time. Hit play. Let's watch the target as I select him. Bam, it goes to the skeleton. I click off. It's not the skeleton. It goes to the skeleton again. But it doesn't move to the skeleton. So let's make him move to our skeleton now. To do that, we'll just go into our update method. And right now, we never set our destination outside of the first um, call, right? Well, actually, where do we set our destination? We set it whenever we do a click. Sorry, I lied. So we only set our destination in the try set ground target. What we want to do instead is if we have a player or an enemy target and we haven't selected a ground target or we're not changing to a ground target, we should set our destination to that enemy target's position. So I can just go right up here. And in fact, basically, if we don't click the button is probably when we want to do it. So I'll say, hey, if we have clicked the button to, to do a raycast and set a target, then we'll try selecting a new target. So I'm going to take this little chunk of code that I'll enter. Uh, maybe not. Let's see. Control Shift R. Am I not able to just refactor this out? Let's see. Alt Enter. It does not want to let me refactor it out. Interesting. So I'm going to take this little chunk of code and I'm going to cut it and I'll say um, handle click. I'll generate a method for that and then I'll just paste the code in. For some reason the refactor didn't want to do it automatically. So I've got two little bits of code here. The first one will handle a click whenever we do it and then we'll say else. Uh, move to target. So now I can get rid of these extra braces here. Generate the move to target method. Um, and then we will, uh, hold on, there's something really weird going on. It sounds like there's a, a weird party happening outside my window right now. I have no idea why. So our move to target is going to say nav mesh agent dot set destination. And we'll set it to our target dot transform that position. Um, give me one second. I have to figure out why there's a party happening outside my window. All right. I have no idea why there's a party happening outside the window, but apparently there is. <laughs> I think it's ending soon, though. It sounds like it's gone away. All right, so this should move us to the target. Sorry about that. So what we're doing here is checking to see if we've clicked. If we have, we'll handle the click. Otherwise, we'll just move to our target. But we actually should only move to our target if our target is not null. So we'll say else if target is not equal to null, then move to target. Otherwise, there's no reason to set a destination to another target. So let's save that off. Let's go back in, hit play real quick, and see if we can now follow around an enemy target just by clicking on it. We click, and he runs over. Is he following him? Let's see. I think he is. Yep. He's going to follow that skeleton. Looking good. Let's uh, make that bigger. In fact, let's uh, make it full screen. We'll maximize. You can see that he just runs and follows the bad guy. Looking good. So now we just need to make him do the attack. He follows him. He gets up to him. He just needs to perform his attack, play that attack animation, and make that guy do the death. So let's set that up next. We'll go oh, back into code. And let's find the part where we're doing our attack. Well, where, where would we do our attack? I guess it would be in our update, right? So in our update right now, we check to see if we should change destinations or change targets. Then we try moving to a target. But then we also probably want to check to see if we should attack our target. So maybe we want to move to the target here. I think that's probably right. But then after that, we'll say if should attack target, then we'll attack our target too. Now it's starting to feel like that these are a lot of scripts that probably should be split into multiple uh, or multiple scripts, a lot of things. But we're not quite at that point where I want to split it yet. So I'm going to leave them in here. But if you're thinking about it, we are kind of getting close to that point where I think like maybe this this attack stuff should be separated out. So let's generate a should attack target method and an attack target method. 
should attack target method is going to be pretty simple. We just want to check to see if we're in range and we've met the attack timer, which is essentially what our enemy does. Let's go take the should attack here from our enemy. Take a look at it. Let's scroll out. Or ready to attack is what I called it, where we do a distance check and a time check. Let's just take this little bit of code and copy it. So I'm going to take the ready to attack from enemy, take it into player, paste it, and I'm going to replace it over should attack. And then I'll copy that and replace should attack. Just re reuse the same name and reuse that same convention. I think it makes more sense. Now the distance to target check shouldn't check the flag. It should check our underscore targets position. And our attack distance, well, that probably makes sense to have as a field on our player as well. So I'll just generate a field for it, hit F12, and replace private with a serialized field attribute. And then give ourselves an attack range of maybe like 1.5 meters. I think that's a fine default. I'm going to get rid of that extra private keyword as well. Oh, and add the F here so that Unity stops complaining about my F missing from my float. All right, now I need a next attack time to finish off the ready to attack. Here, let's collapse this out of here. Take another quick look. So we want to check to see if we're in range. If we're out of range, we return false. We're not ready to attack. Also, if our time hasn't met our next attack time. So if the current time isn't greater than or is it's less than our next attack time, then return false. So we'll generate a next attack time field. F12, go get rid of that private keyword and move it right up here just so that it's in line and separated out from our serialized field. I'm going to get rid of that extra private keyword too. And then we'll, um, let's see, I think that finishes off our ready to attack, which is pretty much literally just a copy paste from the enemy's ready to attack. And then we'll go into the player and set up its attack target. So attack target just needs to say, hey, target dot, um, what do we call it? Like take damage or die? Yeah, target dot die. Um, that's it, right? I think so. So I'll get rid of the private keyword and I think we're good. So that should kill it. So if we're ready to attack, we'll kill the target if we're in range. Let's try it out. Let's hit play and see if it, oh, somebody called that cooldown. Thank you, thank you. When we attack the target, we should also say next attack time equals time dot time. Let's zoom this in. Plus attack delay, which I believe is the name of the variable on enemy. Let's go check that out. Um, so we set up an attack delay right here. Yep, there it is. Attack delay of three seconds. The reason that we want to do this is so that we don't attack every frame. Otherwise, the ready to attack would be true constantly. And we'd be telling this thing to die over and over and over and over, resetting its velocity and stuff. We don't want to do that. We just want to do it once. So we're going to go up here and add that attack delay field right after the attack distance just by pasting it. And I just copied it from the enemy. Then we'll go in and hit play. Now we'll see what it looks like. All right, so now I can go click on the enemy. Bam, he went over there and he killed it. So he killed it. Um, and you can see he's killing it multiple times, attacking it a couple times, but he's not playing his animation. So let's fix that and then let's fix the direction that he's making it fly off in. So first we'll go into his animation or set up his animation. So in the attack, we'll just tell his animator to play that attack trigger. So go to attack target here. I'll say um, animator dot set trigger and pass in that attack zoom in a bit here so you can see what it looks like i'm just setting that attack trigger remember that was on the player's um animator controller which is really overriding from the skeletons controller so go to the animator window here drag it up here it's just this trigger right here that forces us into an attack we're using that same controller just overriding it with our own attack animation so that should make him do the attack animation um, what else do we need to do? Oh, we want to launch him in the correct direction. So let's, um, now that he's doing, he'll do the attack animation. Let's also fix that direction. So when I right now make the enemy die, we're just calling die and passing in a, um, well, really we're just passing in nothing. So we don't have any indication of what direction I really want this guy to go launching in. So let's add in a vector for the force, like a direction that we can kind of launch the character in. I'm going to say vector three. In fact, you know what we can do is just take this launch velocity, make it a parameter. Vector three launch velocity. Uh, that would just be our parameter and we'll pass it in instead. Then I don't need a launch power. I don't need to do this calculation. I do need to, however, trigger that out on the call instead. So I'm going to save this off. We'll go to the part where we reference it. So I just click on the one reference here and I can actually click right here, double click on it to go to the part where we're calling the code. And when we call the die, I'll just pass in a launch velocity. So say launch velocity, but we need to generate that launch velocity. And I think what I'll do is say var launch velocity is transform dot forward. 
plus transform dot up. So I'm just gonna launch it in my characters forward and up direction. And then I'm gonna multiply that by some uh, launch power. In fact, let's see, the launch power is already there. I'm gonna get rid of that minus, and then I'll just move the launch power variable from the enemy to the player. And I think it makes more sense there. Having a, like how hard it gets launched seems like the thing that would be like on the weapon or the player or something, like how hard they knock things back. So I'll delete that and then move it over to the player. Of course, we could have like a multiplier on enemies too for things that are hard to launch or something, but I don't think that we need to do that right now. So I've got a launch power moved over there. Let's save that off too. Let's go try it out. I expect now that I can walk over and launch enemies off the side of the wall or something. Right. So like if I walk over from this angle and I click on this guy, bam, I kind of knock him off and yeah, he goes flying. All right. I think that's um starting to look good. Let me try it one more time though. I'm gonna go launch one more dude. Go launch him, bam. And well, you see the one of the issues that we'll have is that even though his rigid body is going flying, his actual body is staying here. So the visual part of it is doing exactly what we want where it goes flying away. But the actual character, if I pause right now and I just click over to the scene view, and we go over to our skeleton, or where's our skeleton at? Here, if we look at our skeleton right here, you'll see that the actual skeleton here is still in that same position with the nav mesh agent, with the enemy script and the collider. So we need to do um, a little bit of work to really just turn this guy off completely and make it so that he is not hittable anymore, so that he doesn't die again. That once his body goes flying, he's no longer a valid target, I guess. So we can just um, stop playing and let's, um, what do I want to do with this guy? We got a couple of different options. I'm thinking that we'll just, when an enemy dies, we'll just turn off their um, their collider completely. And then we'll do a co-routine to just make them disappear over time. Uh, we could probably just time them out and make them disappear since they're already falling. Or we could have done a fade or something if we wanted to make them fade away over time. But I think we'll just go into the enemy here. And in the die method, we'll just, um, Say, hey, when they die, we'll start a coroutine to uh, destroy the game object. Or actually, we'll just say destroy game object and we'll pass in like a five. So we'll destroy ourselves after five seconds and we'll just get all of our components or we'll get our collider component that's on us and just turn it off. So say get component collider question mark dot enabled equals false. Or no, not question mark, just dot enabled equals false. So we'll turn the collider off that we have on our game object. And that would make it so we can't be used or we can't attack that dude again or can't click on that guy again. And then we'll um, destroy ourselves after time. The other thing I guess we want to do is make sure that we can't die multiple times. So if our nav mesh agent is off or if we've already died, we should probably just return out of this. So we'll say if dead return. And then we'll say dead equals true. And then we'll generate a field for it. Now we could have just checked to see the nav mesh agent state or the animator state or something else. But in my opinion, it tends to get messy when you start to do that. When you start to look at random components and the state of them or other things that are somewhat loosely related as a check for this kind of stuff, it turns into a mess later on because then you wanna change it and then other things unexpectedly change. Adding a dead variable makes it very, very simple. So we can only die once and uh, that oh, I think was really gonna clean things up. So let's try it out. So hit play, we'll run over here and we'll attack. Bam, he goes flying and looking good. So we can't attack him twice. So there's, well, we can't attack him twice. It just doesn't actually do anything. But now I think what we want to do is set up a bunch of enemies, make them start moving over to the, the flag. And then maybe I can build out a level and we'll start setting up some traps and things that can actually kill our enemies. So let's, uh. Let's set up a spawner first so we can have a couple different dudes. Or, let me think. Yeah, I'm gonna set up a spawner because that's gonna take just a couple seconds. And then we'll uh, put the code up real quick. And then we'll go through the process of making traps and towers and all of that fun stuff. Um, while we do this though, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button or just share if you don't mind. I really appreciate it. It does help a lot. Um, get stuff out there and just gets more people in here. And like I said, once we get to a thousand likes, if we get to that, I'm just gonna give out a code for um some of these, these this character set. It's a really cool set, and I, I whoever gets it should be pretty happy. I bought it and I love it. So 
All right, let's set up a spawner now. I'm gonna go into the scripts folder. We'll right click, create a new C sharp script and call it spawner. The spawner is just going to load or it's just gonna create enemies um, every so often. So whatever, we'll have a timer. It'll spawn an enemy every so many seconds out of some collection of enemies. We'll start with just one. And that's pretty much it. Those enemies will just run over to the flag and try to kill us. So we'll, let's see, get rid of our start method and clear up just the update. And here, say, if ready to spawn, spawn. Oh, there we go. Got to control Z a little bit and clean that up. So we'll generate these two methods, get rid of the private keywords there that I don't need. The ready to spawn check can just say return time dot time greater than, let's see, greater than or equal to next spawn time. So if our time is greater than the next spawn time, we're ready. So we'll generate a field for that, turn this into an expression body method. That's nice and tiny here. And I'm actually gonna see, take this and move it right up above spawn so that it's in the same order that it's actually called. So if we're ready to spawn, meaning our time has met that time, then we'll spawn. So we'll say, first thing we want to do is set our next spawn time equal to time dot time plus our spawn delay, whatever that's going to be, some number of seconds. We'll generate a field for it real quick. Hit F12, replace private with serialize field. And I'll have to fix that spelling and then give it a default value of like, I'm going to go with like seven seconds. Now I'm going to see if I can spell this right. Serialize field. There we go. Get rid of that private keyword again. All right. So now we'll spawn an enemy every however often, but we need to actually do the spawning. So we'll call the spawn method, but that's about it. So let's do the instantiation. Instantiate it, we'll say var enemy, um, or let's say um, var instance, because maybe this isn't just spawning enemies. I think it's probably just spawning enemies. Uh, but the instance is going to be equal to game object dot instantiate, and we want to instantiate our prefab, which doesn't exist yet, at our transform position and our transform rotation. This will spawn at our current position, our spawner's position, and our spawner's rotation, and we'll create this prefab. I'm going to copy the prefab here, go up and create a serialized field for it. I'll make serialized field of type game object and just use prefab. That's probably going to be an enemy. I'll probably do something with an enemy here and not just allow generic game objects. But until I get to that point where I actually use something on the enemy, there's zero value in actually saying that it's an enemy only. In fact, there's really no value in keeping the return value of it or doing anything with it. So I'll just instantiate the prefab at that position every so often. Clear out all the extra space, all these gray unused lines, and that's the entire code. Let's upload this whole code real quick. I'm gonna put it into that gist. So if you're looking at the file down below, you can grab it and I'm gonna update all of the other files in here and then we'll go try it out and see how it works. So I'm gonna hit add file. Here, I'm just doing this right in here, by the way. Anybody that's kind of curious what this looks like, just go in and add file and I'm paste in my spawner code, put in spawner.cs, and then we'll add another file for, let's see, what do we have? We've got our enemy, and maybe I don't need another file. We've got my spawner, I've got my enemy and my flag. So I'll copy the enemy. Oh, I need to paste in the player. I'll paste that over the enemy. We'll take the flag code, whoop, control Z, flag code, control A, control C, copy it all, paste that all in over here. So control A, control V. And then the last one is gonna be the player. So I'll select that player code. And I'm gonna go down here. I'm gonna add the player code. So drop it in, put it in player.cs. By the way, the reason that I like this so much is like, I don't have to do any of the formatting. I just paste it in, put in the file extension. It's gonna format it. And then it's gonna give it to you all nice and neatly on this page. So I just give you this page and um, hopefully you were able to see it there on, on the page linked below. You can see all the code. All right, so we've got our player set up and um, Let's see, what was I doing? I, I lost my train of thought for a second. Oh, I was gonna hit play and actually watch the spawners in action. We'll create a spawner and then watch it in action. Now somebody was mentioning uh, health bars too. It's definitely something we could add. We could put health bars in for our um, player or for our enemies if we wanna give them some health. First, I just wanna kill them though and set up all the cool traps because that's a lot more fun than counting down their health. We already have health for the, uh, the flag too. And health bars are pretty common thing. There's lots of different ways to set them up. So maybe we'll get to them though. All right, we've got the skeleton. I want to do a spawner. So I'm going to create a new game object. I'm going to, I usually like to start with like a cube or a sphere or something for a spawner, just so I have a default thing where I can see the object at first and get an idea of where it's at. Then I'll just remove those things. So I've got my cube here. I'm going to rename it from cube to spawner. We'll add a spawner script to it. 
And then I'm going to remove the collider or just un actually let's just remove the collider completely and uncheck the mesh renderer because I know that the position right now is right down here. And then I'll hit the little uh, icon button and I can just hit this to get an icon that shows up. I guess I'll turn on the mesh renderer if I want to see where this thing is, but I'm just going to leave it off. So I've got the spawner there and now I have a field for my prefab. This is the thing that's going to spawn, but I don't have an enemy prefab. So I'm going to take my skeleton and make him into a prefab. We'll go to the assets folder, right click, create a new folder and make it our prefabs folder. It's going to be our first prefab. So we'll go into that folder, take the skeleton and drop him into the prefabs folder. Take the spawner, select it and assign the skeleton as our prefab. Hit play and watch the magic occur, right? We should now see skeletons spawning and spawning every seven seconds. There are two because there's already one place, but I can click around and knock them off. Come on, die. Oh, okay. It's acting a little bit weird on the death there, but interesting. I'm not sure why they're, they're, they're ragdolling a little bit strange. That guy did, did a great job though. Some of them are acting a little strange with their animation, um, but we'll figure that out later. I think right now I've got these dudes launching off and spawning. I want to set up the traps. So, so far, I think um, things are looking good. It's time to build up some traps, right? Um, is there anything I missed? I guess in chat, if anybody's got anything that I missed before we set up some traps, let me know. Otherwise, I'm thinking that we'll set up a way to allow our player to replace a block or maybe place a trap on top of a block. I'll have to go through what the different traps are and see what the options are and then maybe build out some more stuff. So let's take a look. Uh, I had to take a drink there. I, uh, the colliders probably are just clipping through um, on the ground and everywhere else and hitting each other. I'll figure that out though. It's looking at seeing what's going on in chat. How's everybody doing, by the way? Thanks everybody for coming out here. I appreciate it for you know, just having a bunch of people in these streams. It's kind of crazy seeing. So many people just join and watch and, and give a bunch of cool feedback on stuff to put into these things and, and how to build these. So it's been a, it's been fun stuff. <laughs> I just have a blast with these. All right. So I think, um, I want to go through the traps now. Take, I took a break there for a second to think, but what, what I want to set up now are some of these different traps and see what would be interesting, like, uh, that we could put down that will kill the bad guys. Right. Because I, I could build out a cool level and stuff, but I think any any of us could build out a cooler level than me. I just want to set up the code and make make the code part cool. So let's uh, take a look at these traps that are available. There are a couple things that they already have by default. There's this spike trap, this swinging trap, and a trap door. I think the spike trap makes a lot of sense as a default one. So I'm going to take the spike trap and just take a quick look at it. Let's hit drag it out into the scene and see what this object actually looks like. I'm going to expand it out and. Oh, actually, here it's got an animator on it. It's got an animator controller. I'm guessing that it probably just plays the animation when we hit a trigger. Let's hit play and see. Got play mode on. Oh, I'm going to get out of maximize. Oh, I can see it actually animating already. That's promising. So I'll go out of maximize on play. Hit play again. And then let's hit the uh, open button. All right, open actually forces it the up, it looks like. And then close goes down interesting so i think what i want to do is set up a separate animator controller it just pushes it up and then um pushes it down i kind of add at a rate that i want or let me think i don't want to do that yeah i think that's maybe i'll just use the animation that's already on there so let's set up a way so that our player can first place this trap i'll make it so that a player can drop out a trap on the ground they can create an object that spawns on a tile on the ground and then we'll do something with that. Maybe it'll be this trap and it'll pop up the spikes. Maybe it'll just kill everybody that walks over it. I don't know. We'll start with something simple and then we'll expand on it as we go. So let's create an object that we can um, spawn and a way for us to spawn it. In fact, let's think about really quickly how I want to make this spawn. So right now we click to move around and I think that that, that mostly works, right? We just click and move. Maybe if I just hit, um, I'm thinking maybe I'll just hit like one on the keyboard select the thing that I want to build and then that will give me the item on my mouse and I'll just drop it into the scene. I think that that will work and it'll be relatively simple. So I can hit one to select like a spike trap, put it out there onto whatever block I want and then it'll replace it. So let's um, do that now. Let's create a, I'm thinking I want to make a new script for this, 
a trap placement script that's not part of the player script. Because the player script is moving around and attacking and all that. And this is a totally different type of behavior. So I'm going to create a new script in our assets scripts folder. And let's call this a trap placer. And we'll open that script up. Oh, look at that. We get a new instance of Visual Studio. Gotta love when it does that. So our trap placer script is going to do two things going to keep track of what trap we want to place. Well, we'll start with just a single trap, I guess. And we'll make sure that when we have that trap ready, we can place it. Maybe I'll place traps with a right click. So we'll, we'll look for a right click and we'll place a trap whenever we right click. And then we'll be able to switch through the different traps. That seems like a good plan. So let's get rid of the start method here and zoom in the update. In the update, we'll check to see if we've right clicked. So we'll say if input dot get mouse button down. And we'll check for mouse button one. That's the right click. If we've right clicked, then we will, um, what do we, well, I guess we'll do a ray cast, see what tile we clicked on and then spawn the thing at that tile. So we've already got a ray cast set up right here in our player. So let's just go to the player code where we do the check for the ray cast, where we do our handle click. We do a ray right here. We do our alloc or our ray cast non alloc. Um, I'm going to just copy these two lines of code, go back over to our trap placer and paste them. So we'll create our ray. And we'll do our array cast. I'm going to generate the results hit again, or the results array. So we'll generate this variable here, which is going to be a field. And again, the reason that we're doing this is so that we don't allocate memory when we do the ray cast because we don't want to X. Well, if we're doing this often, we don't want to be allocating memory that we don't necessarily need to. Just a good habit to get into. So we're going to make the ray cast hit array up here, and we're going to pre allocate it. We'll say equals new ray cast hit array. And we'll give it a size of, I went with 100 before, so I'll go with 100 again. And then we'll say, actually, you know what? I'm going to get rid of the non alloc I'm going to change this up. Because I, I know that it's it's good for performance, but I don't want to confuse people too and make you think that like you really need to worry about the performance when we're doing this right click. Let's just do a simple raycast. Let's say var hit equals physics.raycast. And we're going to do a raycast in, in there. And we're going to say... Um, what do I want to do? Let, let me think about it. I'll say math f dot infinity, and we're going to give it. Oh, actually, no, we're going to do a out var hit info. Just trying to think of what I want to do. Okay, so what this is going to do, because this is another way to, to write this, and I think it's important that you know more than one way to write things. Don't just think that you need to optimize stuff all the time. Just because it showed the non alloc one doesn't mean that we need it every time you're right clicking. So when we're right clicking, we're going to do a raycast. This hit will now be a bool instead of an int. The raycast call just returns back one thing. It's going to give us the one object that we hit. I'm just going to look to see if we've hit the ground. And then here we'll just get a, um, actually, let's do a layer check. So we'll do a, a check against the layer. So we'll say layer mask dot get mask. And we'll use the word ground here as our layer mask. So we're going to do a raycast only against the ground because Realistically, when we're placing a trap, we never want to click on an enemy. We don't care if there's an enemy there. We want to ignore it completely. So we'll just make the raycast only hit the ground. So I've set up my raycast now to use that as the layer mask. But I actually need to make the layer exist too. So I'm going to go into my floor here, go select it. I'm going to select layer and then hit add layer. The so ground layer doesn't exist yet. So I'll select user layer eight, which is the first empty one. And I'll just type in the word ground with capital G. I need to make sure that these match. Then I'm going to go back to the floor. Because when I did that, it added it to the list, but it didn't assign it. So I need to go hit ground and then allow it to assign it to the children as well. So what that's going to do is go into all of these little children here, all of these little blocks, and it's going to assign them to that ground layer. So my raycast will hit that ground layer and hit those objects only won't hit the NPCs. All right. Now that I've got that, what I want to do is say if hit. So if I actually hit something, in fact, another way to write this is just say if our physics dot raycast was successful. Let's clear this up a little bit. So if the raycast actually hit something, it returns true, then we'll have the thing that we hit in this hit info object, or this is a raycast hit named hit info. So what we can do is just say um var position equals hit info dot point. This is like the place that we want to spawn the object at. We can say instantiate uh we'll say underscore trap prefab pre let's see if I can spell that right. And we'll spawn it at our position or our hit info dot point. And then we'll spawn it at quaternion dot identity. So we're, the quaternion dot identity is just a default. It's our default rotation. So we're just going to spawn it essentially as if you'd put in zero, zero, zero on the rotation and not rotate it at all. 
Now we might want to set up a way to spawn these at different rotations, but for now we're just going to leave them at their default and assume that any object placed at a zero rotation or non-rotated will look right in our game. We need to create a trap prefab and I'm going to get rid of line 14 here too. Let's, see, let's scroll down just a little bit in case my head gets in front of that stuff. And then let's um, generate our trap prefab. So generate a field for it, hit F12. We'll go up here and say game object and then replace private with serialized field. Again, this will probably become a trap later, but right now we just want to spawn any object that we have assigned whenever we right click. So get rid of lines one and two, get rid of that extra line there at the bottom, go back into Unity, and then let's set up a trap object that we can actually spawn with our trap placer. So I'm going to go back over here to our player, which doesn't have our trap placer script. We'll add our trap placer, and then we'll assign a trap prefab to it. So we need to actually create a prefab for this. I think I've got this spike trap already created as an object. I'm gonna turn it into a separate trap or a separate new prefab. So I've got the prefab selected. This is the one from the asset pack, from this dungeon pack, but I'm gonna select it. I'm gonna go into my prefabs folder. I'm gonna drag and drop it into here and I'm gonna hit original prefab and make it a new prefab so that it's totally unrelated to that asset pack. Well, I mean, related to it, but it's not part of the asset pack. Then I'll rename it to spike trap with a space in there. So it's my slightly differently named version. Delete this one out of here. And then I'll go to my player and assign the spike trap as the object. Now, what I expect to happen is if I right click on the ground, I spawn a spike trap. Now that spike trap shouldn't actually work or do, do what I want it to do or be right, but I expect it to spawn and appear. Let's try it out. Not bad, right? So I click, spike traps just appear. I can click and spawn as many as I want, just anywhere I want. Now, obviously there's some issues, like I can click on the edge and spawn them way off to the side, spawn them down here, and they just keep popping up and not actually doing anything. But hey, it works, right? We've got spike traps and they're, they're able to spawn relatively simply, right? So let's uh, make the spike traps actually work. Um, while I think about how we're gonna do that, if everybody could hit the like button or just share the stream, I really appreciate it because it helps again. We're almost up to like a thousand likes and I can give away this asset pack and I'll be super excited about it. We only need a couple hundred more. I'll take another drink and then we'll, um, we'll make the th first rule. I think I'm going to think I'm, I'm going to talk out loud and think out loud for a second, but I think we'll either spawn the um, traps at the correct position. So that they kind of get centered onto a cube pretty easy to do, or we'll um, make them active. I think I want to make them spawn onto a cube first. And then we'll make them um, activate. And I'm thinking that the reason that I want to make them spawn onto a cube is because it's such a cubey world. Like it's so easy to do that I could just take one of these cubes, even make the trap like a child of it, and then offset it to its trap position. And I think that would work. Right? I think that would probably be fine. So um, let's try it out. Oh, did you know you hit SF tab to auto complete serialized build? Let's try that. It did not work for me. SF tab made a blend shape manager. So no, <laughs> unfortunately. All right, so let's, uh, let's make these things snap into position. So the first thing we'll do is we're gonna instantiate this trap prefab at that position, but I want to, um, well, actually I wanna get the object that we hit, get that thing's position and then get its offset. So instead of using the hit info dot point, we're gonna say var hit object equals hit info, or actually no, we use the hit info dot collider dot position dot transform dot position plus vector three dot up. So I'm gonna call this a hit point or placement point. And then we'll copy that and paste that in here. Now the reason that this is gonna work, at least I'm pretty sure it's gonna work is because my things are two units tall. Because my cubes are two units high, if I take the center point that's right in the middle of that cube and I go up one meter, it should be right at the center, right in the middle. So I'm using my transform position plus one meter straight up. I think that's gonna center it. Let's try it out real quick. I'll hit play and see if it works. Click, oh, right click, bam, look at that. Now it puts them into the spot that I expect. That's actually pretty cool. Oh, except look at that, did I click on the, guy what did i click on there I, i'm not sure why that one went up there is it <gasps> hold on is it letting me click on these bad guys it seems like it is so for some reason my 
layer mask check is not working. Why is that not working? Let me double check. So the floor is set to ground. The enemies should not be set to ground, right? They're, they, they wouldn't make sense to be set to ground. So is my layer check not working? What did I do there? Um, let me see. Oh, I'm using the wrong, uh, the wrong. Okay. This happens all the time, by the way, to, to a lot of people, not just me. So if you've ever had it happen to you before and you're freaking out, like, don't worry, it's not just you. So what happened here is I rearranged things and I messed up my call order here. So what I'm doing is my ray is correct. That's the first parameter here. My second parameter, the hidden info is correct. My third parameter is using max distance, but I'm passing in a layer mask. So actually, because there are 16 overloads for this, used the wrong one. I wanted the one that has, let's see, I, I'm thinking mathf.infinity here, and then a layer mask. There we go. Now I've got a distance and a layer mask. So I'll save, we'll go back in, hit play, try it again. And I think that that's gonna fix the issue. Let's try it. Now if I right click, yeah, there we go. Now my layer mask check is actually working. Of course, you might also notice I can still put like, a ridiculous number of traps onto this thing. Kind of an issue. I think I'll fix that real quick and then um, we'll make it actually kill the things. So let's make it so I can't put multiple traps on there. To do that, I'm gonna say var instance or let's say var trap equals that. We'll instantiate our trap. And then I'll say trap dot trans uh, uh, trap dot transform dot set parent. And I'm gonna set it to the hidden info dot collider dot transform. So what we're doing here is moving this trap to be a child of the object or the block that I place it on. Because I'm using this weird block system for the game, I think it's gonna work. If I was using like a regular terrain, I'd have to come up with something different. But I think that setting these as a child here is gonna work because then all I have to do is say, hey, if I already have a trap on me as a child, then just don't, I can't use this block as a trap. It's not a valid trap block, so don't don't try to use me. So to do that, I could just say like, um. Well, how do I want to do it? Let's, let me think for a second. Uh, actually, I mean, I could even turn off the collider on there. There's a lot of different things I could do. But I think what I want to say is, well, first I want to create a trap script so that we can assign a trap and make that a component. So I'm going to go up here, add a public class trap and make it a mono behavior. And then we'll um, move that to its own file. So hit alt enter and hit move to trap.cs. Now I have a trap script that I can assign to stuff. And then I'll replace game object here with trap. And then I'll replace the word trap here with trap as well. So we've got trap trap equals instantiate trap prefab. And then when we do the ray cast and we get the object, what I want to do is just check to see if it already has a trap child. If it does, then I won't spawn one. If it doesn't, then I will spawn one. So I'll say if hit info dot collider dot get component in children trap is not equal to null return. And I think that's enough, right? So if we have a trap on us already, then we won't do the code to spawn a trap. Otherwise we will. In fact, let's explicitly call this out. I'll select it all, alt enter and call this spawn trap. So that'll actually spawn the trap. So we'll either spawn a trap or not do it if we already have one in that spot. So now if I go back in and hit play, you should be able to right click on the same spot a bunch of times and not see multiple traps appear. Oh, oh, actually I can't spawn anything because I lost my trap script or I lost my trap object. So my trap prefab right now doesn't have that empty trap script. So I need to collapse all these down. Just add that script that I created. Remember, it doesn't have anything on it. I can just open it up. It's a totally empty script right now. And then I need to reassign that to my player. So go select the player, go back to that prefabs folder, assign that spike trap again, hit play. And let's see now I can right click, place a trap. I can't place a whole bunch of them in one spot though. Just one per block. Oh, it's actually quite a bit easier than I'd even expected. So let's Stop playing and let's figure out um, how to make the enemies actually die. So lots of tips here, by the way, um, checking to see if there's colliders. Yeah, there are all kinds of different ways that we could do this, by the way, for just determining whether or not a trap could be placed. We can mark something on those blocks. We could add a script to them. We could change a tag. We could swap out their layer. Um, we could even add a collider over the top that makes them unclickable. Lots of lots and tons of different options, really. So I just kind of going with any random one. Um, but if you're, if you're coding it up and you're trying to figure out which one to go with, it, whatever works for you should be fine. So let's see what we want to do next. I think the next piece is going to be to make the trap actually activate, right? So the trap should 
play um play its animation and then kill the enemies when it animates so how do we want to do that i think what i might do is just use an um enemy or, or not an so we can use the enemies die method which is somebody just called out in chat thank you but we could also use um the animators animation callbacks so i think we'll use an animation callback and make that trigger off something in the trap that kills all of the enemies that are inside of the trap so my thought here is we'll set up a collider or a trigger we'll keep track of the enemies that are inside it and then just kill the enemies that are inside it whenever um whenever the trap goes off seems simple enough right so let's take a trap and drop it out into the scene just to get it get it placed and get it looking right then i'm going to add a collider to it so i'll add a box collider and i'm going to make the collider a little bit taller so i'm going to instead of being 0.18 let's make it like one meter tall and let's move the position up a bit so that it's nice and tall we have this actual actual cube here we'll set it as a trigger and then we'll open up the trap script and what i want to do here is add an on well let me think do i want to add an on trigger stay or an on trigger enter i think what we'll do is keep track of all of the objects on the inside the trigger um as they come in and out and i'll just do this so that we can have a list and just for fun so let's say on trigger enter and we'll say um enemies oh actually here let's get an enemy from it so we'll say var enemy equals other dot get component enemy and then if the enemy is not equal to null we'll add it to our enemies list we'll say enemies dot add enemy pretty simple I hit generate field for it and we'll create a field that's going to be a list of enemy now list didn't auto complete it gave me auto audio listener because i don't have the using statement here so i'm put list again hit alt enter and add the using statement for collections.generic i'm going to get rid of private and just replace it with serialized field so we can see the list in the inspector without switching to debug mode and then i'm going to go into um or go down a little bit and just add an on trigger exit in fact i'm going to copy the on trigger enter paste it replace enter with exit and then replace add with remove no reason to write all of that out so now when we enter the trigger we'll add ourselves to the list when we exit we'll remove ourselves very very simple um and that should be enough so that when we fire off the trap we could just kill everything that's inside of her call the die on it so let's um actually let's, let's do that too let's let's make it so that we can trigger the trap um let's say public void trigger trap and then here we'll just say for each bar enemy in enemies enemy dot die and then we need to give it a velocity so we'll say um vector three dot up times five we'll just launch them straight up in the air they won't launch back they'll just go straight up all right so that should be it for our trigger trap we just need to make a way to call it so i add a context menu say trigger trap and now i should be able to go into unity watch the enemies run over it and then watch them i guess fly let's try it out so we'll hit play oh whoops i, I need to um actually update my trap so let's stop playing i need to update the prefab so i i modified that spike prefab but i didn't actually apply it so i'm going to hit apply all here there's just off the screen so i went over here and hit apply all i totally just missed it you see let me just change this real quick so you can see what it looked like again so it was like that and i hit apply all let's change that back to a two and i don't think i have any changes there we go apply it all again now i've got my my box actually updated and then i should be able to right click on it and hit trigger trap once they're inside of it so i'm gonna hit play one more time and i'm just gonna watch the enemies go through this trap and then i'll hit the trigger trap button once they're on top of it Oh, they're not actually inside the trap okay we're gonna try this one more time i'm gonna duplicate my trap because i'm terrible at playing really fast i'm gonna hit play i'm gonna watch them come into the trap so we should see the enemies list go up once they enter it we did not see the oh okay why didn't we see the enemies list go up i think that the reason here is because we don't have a rigid body on our skeleton so we're going to go to the skeleton the enemy at a rigid body and then we're going to make it kinematic uncheck the has gravity and then we'll apply the override and play again so that we're actually going into the component to enter the trigger we need to have a rigid body on one of those things 
there we go. Now you can see that there's an enemy in it. There's two enemies in it. If I right click and hit trigger trap and unpause, you see that they went flying and they went launching up in the air. So now I just need to make it so that that code isn't called by me right clicking and is instead called whenever the animation fires off. So whenever our animation triggers and the spike goes up, I want the enemies to die. Now, I don't think that I really want to have that completely controlled by the animator like it is right now in this animation controller. So I'm going to make my own animator that controls the opening and closing real quick. And then we'll um, we'll use that as our as our control point. And then we'll set up the code to actually trigger it on and off. So let's go into the project view and let's find this trap, this spike trap right here. I think it's this is our controller. I'm going to duplicate that controller, drag it over to my animation folder right here and then just rename this to spike trap with a space in it so i know it's mine i'll open it up and then i'm just going to add an open and a closed state that we transition between instead of two triggers here i want to have just a bool so i'm going to add a boolean parameter and i'll say open i'm going to delete the open and close triggers here that that were already on this one and then i'm going to make a well let's make um close the default so i'll set that as the default state delete this empty one i'll make a transition from close to open and a transition from open to close. I'm gonna delete out these any transitions here. There we go, I think that looks better. And then what I wanna do is just set up the condition so that open makes it go to open and close makes it go to close. So click on the open one, open, it's true. Um, I don't know, I need has exit, I probably, maybe I need has exit time on, I'm not sure how these are set up, I'm gonna leave them. I'll add the condition for open to false on that one and save it off. So now what I expect is if I use this controller, I should be able to just check the box, turn them, turn it up and down. I have no idea if that's gonna work. I haven't really played with this animation. So we're gonna find out. I've got the spike trap selected. I need to go swap out the controller. Take the new controller that I just made, assign it there, go select it again, go to the animator. Now I should see the correct one. I hit play. I'm just gonna hit the open box and hit that. Yep, there we go. It does exactly what I want. So if I check open, it's up. If I check close, it's closed. So I'm gonna stop playing, or yeah, I stop playing, save it off, and I'm gonna go into my spike trap code right now, and then make it just say open or close. Or, you know, open and close doesn't really make sense. I'm gonna call this active. Because I think like, I might wanna have a bunch of different traps and they're all gonna wanna set the active state. So I'll set it to active to true. So when I trigger my trap, um. Uh, actually, yeah, when I when I fire off the trap, how do I want to do that? I want to set the animator to active and I want to call trigger trap in my code. Okay, yeah, pretty simple. So let's add an update method here. Say update. I'll say if should trigger trap. Or, or let's say if um should trigger. Let's say if should toggle trap. I like that better. So if should toggle trap, then toggle trap. So we'll generate a method for if the should toggle trap and then another one for toggle trap. I'm gonna move the should one up here since that's what I wanna deal with first. Get rid of that private keyword, get rid of all these private keywords really. And then let's figure out how we determine if we should toggle the trap. I'm gonna say if the time is greater than or equal to next toggle time, then the answer is true. So say return time dot time greater than or equal to next toggle time. Pretty simple, so we'll just toggle on and off at a time generate a field for that and turn this into an expression body method. And then we'll get rid of that private keyword too. Now, the next thing I wanna do is say, hey, when we toggle the trap, let's set our next toggle time equal to time dot time plus um, maybe a toggle rate. So say underscore toggle rate, generate a field for toggle rate and hit F12, make that a serialized field and give it a value of, I'm gonna go with like five seconds. Now let's go with three so that it stays for three seconds. Turns up and down every three seconds. Um, I'm gonna put that right here, I think. No, I wanna move the toggle time up. I'm trying to figure out where I wanna place these things so that my serialized fields are next to each other. So that's enough to determine if we should toggle and then set the toggle time. But the next thing I need to do is actually turn on that animation, right? So let's set the animation to either true or false based on what state we want it to be in. If we want it to be toggled on or off or active or inactive. So we'll say get component animator, not animation, animator dot set bool. And then what did I name this? I already renamed it to active instead of open. So I'll switch that to active. And we want to set it to whether or not it should be active. Um, so say underscore trap active. 
So this is going to be a bool that we'll just turn on and off in our toggle trap. So here I'll copy this and say trap active equals not trap active. That'll switch a bool. So if it's true, it'll switch to false. If it's false, it'll switch to true. But I need to declare it first. So I'm going to hit alt enter, generate a field for it, go up to it. And let's change this from object to bool because it's a bool. It's true or false only. And get rid of that private keyword. So now we've got a defaulted to false trap active var variable. It's going to be off by default. And then every so often or every toggle time, this will return true. We'll call toggle trap, which will update our toggle time to the next whatever, three seconds or whatever it's going to be, three seconds from now. It'll switch that Boolean state and it will say, hey, set it to either trap active or trap not active. Now, the last thing we want to do is when we activate the trap, um, make the enemies go flying. So say if trap active, then trigger trap. So that will make the uh, trap launch the enemies up in the air if uh, if the trap is set to active in this this toggle. So here we go, let's try it out. I think that um, honestly, we should have just working traps now. I don't think that we're missing anything. Let me make sure I don't have anything to apply in overrides. There we go, got that set up. I'm gonna delete the two traps that are placed, save, hit play, and I'm gonna see if I can kill enemies now with traps. So I drop out a trap, drop out another trap, come on traps. I'm going to hit the enemies in time. I don't think they're going to time right. Okay, well, oh, what happened there? Watching. There we go. Now enemy, I saw an enemy die like I expected. Let's see if another one dies. All right, looking better. Now I could add a little bit of a delay so that they don't um, go flying up right away and maybe like they're a tiny bit of a delay so they kind of look more impaled or something. But I think that on the stream, it's probably even hard to see that there's even a delay there. Look at that. My traps are working. I'm able to launch them. I can run over here, knock the dudes back. I can run around and right click and place traps. I think I want to add um, at least one more trap type before we wrap this up. I also want to see if we can get at least to like 750 likes. Maybe we'll get to 750 and I'll just show that code here. I don't know if we're going to get to 1,000, but get to 750. I'll put the code up and then somebody can grab it and we'll have a lot of fun with it. But first let's put in at least one more trap. So let's go through um, the trap section here and let's see what the options are. They've got a swinging trap and a trap door that are already created. What else is in here? Um, a little fire thing and a fire. Any, any other cool traps? A cage. Lots of cool props here, but I don't know if there's lots of cool pre-made traps. So I think I wanna go with one of these two. And I'll just let everybody in chat decide. So we'll either go with a um, swing trap. Here's this one. So it'd be like this thing that's going back and forth and maybe it'll smack into enemies and launch them flying one way or the other. Or a uh, trap door that'll just drop them down and kill them. So if you have a preference, go ahead and put in the one that you prefer right now into chat. And then we'll go with uh, whichever one gets the most votes in just a second. We'll drop that one in, we'll build it up, and hopefully we'll be at 750 likes before we even get to that point. Ah. And I'll take a drink and um, eat some more milk duds while we wait. I'm trying to think of what other cool stuff would be fun. Here. I think I, I'm going to build out some levels or a little bit more map while uh, everybody talks about what thing they want to see added. There we go. We're in grid snapping mode. Just duplicate out some more. I feel like my level is a little bit lame and I'm not a great level designer, but I probably make something a little bit cooler. So may as well. Hmm. I see lots of talk about the swing trap in there. A little bit about the trap door and some flamethrower. Give it another second or two. Do a couple more of these uh, little blocks. And then, ooh, what, watch this. This would be kind of interesting because of how this game is set up. Maybe it'd be like uh, some alternate paths that, that might make sense that we could set up traps on, right? Like that i have no idea I'm, I'm like i said a terrible terrible level designer in my beautiful level design work so okay i think um i'm gonna go through the answers here lots of lots of swing trap a bit of swing trap door stuff too i think that we'll um 
Ooh, a trap door that teleports back to the front, too. That's not a bad idea, either. Um, hmm. Maybe we're just doing both. But, well, let's start with the swing trap, since it got the most votes, so. Actually, first, let's go and rebake our nav mesh, because I just added a bunch of new terrain. Let's hit bake and see what we get. All right, so now let's see, how do I want to set this up? I'm going to take um, my spawner, duplicate it and move it over here. So we have two spawners, we have enemies coming from two spots, and then we'll make our swing trap. So now that we've got um, multiple enemies coming in. And obviously we don't have any costs on this, so we're kind of overpowered, but I think that that's fun for now. Um, adding in costs and limiting ourselves is easy to do. Um, killing things is a lot more fun so let's stop playing and let's set up our swing trap now so our first trap is this little spike one and it's just got a collider that checks to see if the enemy is inside it and then when it triggers it fires off and hits all of the enemies i think that the swing trap is probably going to be a little bit different because it's really just like a swinging object going back and forth that should smack enemies and if it hits them i guess just kill them Right, I, I, I can't think of anything else that it should do right now, so let's do that. So we'll go into our dungeon pack, we'll go into our traps, prefabs and traps, take the swing trap, and I'm gonna drag it right out here. I'm gonna set it up as a big giant trap and turn it around. There we go, so, okay, this is gonna set up a little bit different, so let me think this through. So I'm not sure how I'm gonna let the player place it yet. So I, I probably will set it up um, pre-placed and then we'll figure that out right after that. So let's hit play and see how this animates actually. Okay, so it just kind of swings back and forth. It does swing kind of fast. I think I wanna slow that down a little bit. So go to the swing trap. I'm going to change the speed to 0.5. Hit play. Try it one more time. Okay, I think that's better. I'll give my players a little bit of time to walk through. Or to the enemies. Hmm. In fact, I might need to even modify the animation a little bit more. It seems like it's going to hit a lot. But whatever. We'll go with it the way that it is. So let's expand it out. And let's set up a collider on the blade. So what I want to do is make it so that this blade, whenever it hits an enemy, it just kills the enemy. So I'm going to right click on it and we'll hit create. Um, I'm going to create a cube. I'm going to hit W, move it down here and just make it right there as a child. I'm going to hit play and just make sure that this is animating the way I expect it to. So that the cube is in the right spot. It looks good. Now I'm going to take that cube and shrink it down a little bit because I want this to be the collider that the enemies are hitting, but I don't want it to be anywhere near that big. I want it to be a little bit smaller so that it's not super simple to just kill enemies. Let's make it like 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0.5. A little bit smaller. Here, I'm going to hit direct transfer or edit mode again. I'm going to shrink it down even more. I'm going to go with this small cube. So if you hit the little edges there, you're safe. You're not going to die to just everything. Now I'm going to leave the box collider there enabled, but I'm going to turn off the mesh renderer. And then I think I'll save that off. Now I want to add in a component here on the box collider or on this little blade that's going to kill the enemies. So let's call this um, a blade. In fact, I'm going to go into my scripts folder, create a new script for it, and I'm just going to call this um, blade trap. I'll open it up and then we'll add an on collision enter method to it. So say on collision enter. We'll get an enemy component, see if there is one. So we'll say var enemy equals collision dot get component or collision dot collider dot get component. Ah, I got the in parent. Actually, you know what? In parent makes sense. So we'll get component in parent because we may end up hitting one of those other colliders and we'll look for the enemy. So if we get an enemy, we'll kill the enemy. So we'll say if enemy is equal to null, we'll just return. Otherwise, we'll say enemy dot die and Maybe we'll do something else. That's probably it. We probably won't do anything else, but we could do something else to make them kind of go launching. Actually, now we need to um, determine which way to launch the enemy. So I'm going to make them just launch in their backward direction right now. We can make them launch in the direction that we hit them in, but I don't want to deal with that right now. I just want to make them launch kind of backwards. So I'm going to say enemy dot forward or enemy dot 
or do exactly what we did before. Transform dot forward. Negative that plus enemy dot transform dot up. So just launch them up and backwards for now. I think that that'll probably end up looking the best, at least initially. So save this off, get rid of these two using statements up here. Save one more time and we'll go back in and let's see, do we need anything else? We'll go on to our blade. We'll add that uh, blade trap script to it and oh, wrong spot. I'll remove that and drop that onto the cube where it goes and add this. I'm going to rename this cube to um, trap blade or let's call it blade trap. Because that's the actual blade part. So now when this piece hits an enemy, I expect the enemy to just go dying and uh, that, that should fix it. Let's try it out. Bam. One enemy. Two enemies. Three enemies. Okay, so this thing seems to just kind of uh, chop and kill all of them, which is kind of my concern. Was that it seems um, because it plays so often. You know what? Here's what we'll do. Let's change up the animation on this thing so that it's not constantly playing, because otherwise it's going to be too powerful of a trap, and we won't actually be able to use it. So let's see how we would modify that up a little bit. Let's go into the swing trap and take a look at its animation. So it looks like its animation right now. It's probably just an animation that swings it back and forth. Let's go double click on the animation and then select the trap and see it in action. So here you can see the actual animation. We can actually modify it and kind of change it up. I think what we'll do is I'll take this keyframe here, copy it, paste, and I'm gonna drag it um, oh, right to about here. And then I'll take this other, the ending keyframe, copy it, go over the same, where did I go? Two spaces, paste. And then I'm gonna zoom out. So right now this entire animation is set to one second, but it's got a keyframe here. So I added a little tiny pause that so pauses before it goes and then it swings across. But if I select the whole thing now with this select, with the setup, I can drag it out and expand it. And now I should be able to see it kind of sit and wait and then go, it's a little bit slower. I'm gonna expand out the weight though. So now what I can do is take this little section here, make it wait like, um, you know what, let's make it wait one second. And then I'll make it swing for a second. Here, let's zoom, zoom, zoom. So it'll swing at, at the two second mark, it's halfway there. So it'll go sit still for one second, it'll swing, and then it'll get all the way to the, oh, it's getting to the other side in one second. Let's make it get to the other side in two seconds. No, I'm gonna go to a half a second. So it'll wait for a half a second, then it'll swing for one second one way, then it'll wait for a half a second, and then return. I think that that is the timing that I want. Let's try this out. So here we go. So it waits, starts to swing. Starts to, oh, it doesn't wait. I need it to wait here. So I'll copy this, paste, and then it swing for another second. And I can get rid of that keyframe there. There we go. This is closer to what I wanted. Okay, so now I play, bam, swing. Bam, swing. There we go. That's better. Hopefully that made sense to everybody. But essentially just expanding out or modifying this animation. And the reason that we can do that is because this animation here is just part of the project. It's something that's recorded in the project. And if you haven't ever made an animation before, you can just go to an object, go to the animator window, or not animator, animation window, click on this little thing right here and hit create new clip. If there isn't an animation, you can actually just hit the button It'll be right there and you give it an animation name and a path, it'll create an animation, you can record it. So this I think is gonna make it a lot more playable so that my enemies can walk through and they don't always die. Let's try it. There we go. So now it's a trap that takes up two spots, but it's not completely deadly in that it's gonna kill everybody all the time. So I think that that's pretty good. Now let's um, make it so I can place this trap and then we'll crank up zombie spawn. Maybe add one more thing and see if we can get to that um, 750 or 1,000 likes. Could we just hit the button or go drop it on Facebook or Instagram or whatever you uh, you guys use nowadays. Um, so. All right, let, let's do this. Um, so let's make this trap spawnable. I will go to my player. And right now, my trap prefab options are just one. I have a single spike trap. And I want to make it so I can spawn between, I guess, two different traps or multiple. I'll make it so that we can just hit a hotkey and pick the trap that we want to use. 
I'm going to turn the trap prefab into an array and pluralize it. So I'll replace that prefab with prefabs. And then I'll say, um, well, let's add an int for our current trap index. That'll be the trap that we're using. It'll start off at zero and reference the first trap in here. And then we'll say if input dot get key down key code dot one alpha one um trap index equals one or equals zero and then we'll just say hey if we hit um alpha two it'll equal the one now i don't like this code at all obviously like if i'm gonna do more than two i'm gonna change this up and i'm gonna make it so that we just look at the key code loop through them all and then check it um Let's do that. Four, <laughs> like four, one to ten, or let's go. Let's just go to nine. What we're gonna say is if the key code of that plus i, then current trap index equals i, and then break. Okay. All right. Sorry, I, I lied. I was gonna change it anyway. So the reason I'm doing it this way is so that we don't have to set up an if check for each statement. And so that nobody sees that ugly if statement for each one. I don't want to do an if we pressed one, check one. If we press two, check two. If we press two, three, make it three. So what we do instead is loop from zero to nine. So just think of the values zero to nine getting added. We're checking to see if the key code for alpha one, which is one on my keyboard plus zero. So not adding anything to it. So we're literally checking alpha one. If that's pressed, then we set the index to i, which it, first time through is zero. Then if that's not true, we just check the next next iteration of the loop. We say, hey, if alpha one plus one was pressed, which is literally alpha two, like if I put the mouse over it, see the value is 49 plus one, it's going to be 50, which is alpha two. Then we set the index to the next one. So that way we don't have to write the code for um, setting up a bunch of them or copy and paste. It just loops through all of them. So this will let us select the one that we want to select. Now we just need to instantiate the prefab that we want. So instead of instantiating trap prefabs or trap prefab, we do it at current trap prefab index. And that's pretty much it. Now we should be able to select multiple traps and right click and place them. Let's try it out. So go back into Unity. I need to reassign my trap prefabs because that got cleared out. So we'll go to the prefabs folder. We'll take our spike trap, drag that in. I don't have a trap for my, um, my swing trap. So I'm going to drag that down here, make it an original prefab, rename it to swing trap. And then we'll assign that swing trap from the prefabs folder to our player. So go to the player, assign it right here. Oh, I can't actually assign it because it's not a trap. So I'll add the trap script to it and then we'll assign it. So then we'll go, oh, see, that's an issue. That's the thing that I don't really like. I don't like that my trap script right now has a bunch of stuff on it that my swing trap isn't using. So that's probably something that um, if I'm gonna work on this any longer, would want to go back in and clean up because I don't like having the um, the trap script on things that were just doing stuff for no reason. It doesn't necessarily need to be a trap script. There we go. I can drop out my traps. I can right click do that one. So that's the first trap the spike one. I'm gonna hit two on the keyboard, right click and bam, I now have this weird little, um, well, I have this trap that doesn't actually work right because like if I place these, I can place it, but the position and the size is all wrong. So it's not actually where I want it to be or kind of the way that I want it to work. So I'm going to stop playing and we're going to just change this one up a little bit. I want to change the way that the spike trap places. Now I could make the spike trap really smart so that we have to pick two blocks and place it in between those two blocks. But I think what I'm going to do is make the offset of it be like down here at one of these positions so that we just place it on a block and it's just kind of offset and sideways always. I don't really care because this isn't a real game that I'm going to launch that I need to worry about getting it perfect on. So I'm just going to make that a child. So we'll right click, we'll hit create empty, make an empty child, drag that out, make the swing trap a child of that object. And then I think what I want to do is take this, position it down here so that the object is right there on the block, this game object, and then take my trap and move it back. I'm just gonna move it kind of into position. So now that the pivot position is right here, so when I place the object, it's there, but it's offset and kind of in the right spot. Now, obviously it could hang over the edge or something, but I don't really care because again, not something that I need to deal with right here. We could always figure it out if we wanted to and perfect it if we need to later. 
So I'm going to take the trap script, move it up one level, rename this to swing trap. And then I'm going to delete the prefab down here and then just recreate this prefab below. So take the swing trap. Oh, drag it out. Oh, no, I've broken it. So I'm going to hit. What have I done? So when I broke that, when I deleted the prefab down there, I actually broke the child prefab reference. So I'm going to go in here and just break that up. So right click. Um, I can't remember if it's in here. Prefab. Yep. And hit unpack completely. Then I'll take the swing trap and just drag it in. There we go. Now I've recreated the prefab from scratch. So we've got a new prefab. I'll take the player, assign that swing trap one more time. Hit play. I'm going to delete the trap that's out here. Hit play. And now I should be able to hit two and drop out a swing trap. There we go. And I can hit one and drop out spike trap. Now, obviously, my rotation on my swing trap is a little bit strange and the positioning is not perfect, but I think that you can get the idea of exactly how we're placing these things out. I can also click on my enemies and just run around and knock them off the edge. Um, I think I want to do one more trap real quick and then I'm going to do that giveaway and start to wrap things up. We've been going for a while and I want to, you know, we're, I don't think we're going to get to a thousand likes, but if we can get to at least 700, I'll put up that code. But first, we'll do that trap. So if everybody just hit the like button and get us at at least like 700, um, I'll put up the code in just a little bit. I'll let you guys all know before, and somebody can go grab this art pack and you know build this and see whatever you know, if they want to build build this or build something else out of it. I think it's a really cool pack and a lot of fun to to work with. So let's set up the um that little trap that lets enemies just drop down through the ground. Too. I think that that's a kind of a fun one and an interesting one. And it's going to, well, I think require a little bit of a change to the way that these things work. So I'll go into the traps folder. There's a trap door here. And I think if I hit play on it, it's got an open animation. Let's just hit play and watch and see real quick. So we play and yeah, it looks like it's animating. It looks like it opens and closes, right? So let's um, take a quick look though and see how we'd get that to show up. Because right now, if I open that up and we look down, like we're going to, we're not going to see through the, um, we're not going to see through because there's a ground piece down there, right? So if I have this piece down there, you're not going to see underneath it because there's there's ground. So you can't see the guy falling down. So I think what we want to do is make it so that when we place one of these traps, we place a trap door trap, it'll actually replace the ground piece um, completely. So I'm going to have to make a little bit of a change to the code, but I don't think it's going to be too much to do. So let's set it up. Let's make our trap door into its own prefab. So I've got my trap door here. Um, let's see, what do I need to do with it? I want to just add a trap script to it. So I add the trap so we can assign it. Um, it's got an enemies in range. I think that makes sense. I want to add a box collider and I want to make the box collider match up with this object. So I'll make it bigger, resize it and make it kind of match up with my, my thing. So my thought here is that any enemy that's in it, when it activates, will turn off their nav mesh agent turn on their rigid body and just start falling to the ground. So we'll turn, make their rigid body not kinematic and they'll just start falling to the ground. I think that's all we'll need to do. But we need to make sure that when we turn on the trap, um, well, that we control its activation with the trap script and that we, um, what else do we need to do? Oh, disable the tile below it. So let's set up a way to control the animation real quick. So we'll open up that trap door script and it's just like the other one. So this is just like our open and close script on the, uh, or our activate script on the other animator. So let's just go in and create an animator override. I like how I said animator weird, that was strange. So I'm gonna make an override controller for our trap door trap instead of a new controller. So I hit create animator override controller and I'll call this trap door. And then we'll make it override the spike trap, which just has a single animation that it plays open and close. I think that's the way that this thing was set up, right? Let's open up trap D. Got trap door anim D playing in positive direction or negative direction. So that's it. Trap door anim D is the one that we need. So I'll go back to my animator override controller again for the trap door. And we'll find the trap door. I'm going to drag this over so you can see it. Just a quick search. Find trap door anim D, assign it there. Then we'll go to our trap door, assign that animator controller save and now we have control over it in our trap script i didn't have to change anything else actually i want to remove this trapdoor demo script i don't want that on there at all but i didn't have to change anything else because our trap script already triggers that active animation or that active bullet it toggles it on and off 
we're using the animator override controller so i didn't have to do anything at all just reuse the stuff that i've already got so let's watch it um i should see it open and close look at that opens and closes um relatively fine seems like it's doing its job now let's replace one of these tiles real quick with this animator controller so i'm going to take this um i'm going to take this tile right here i'm going to just turn off the box collider and the renderer and i'm going to move this over here and then i'm going to hit play and just watch and see if the dudes uh fall through it oh nope nothing they don't fall through yet and if i move my spawner over i expect that you're not going to see them fall through either so here let's hit play just watch and see you should expect that they're not going to drop through the through the trap right so they're going to walk over it just go right past it the reason for that again if i hit pause and go to navigation is that they're using the nav mesh so they just walk past the place so what we need to do is make our trap actually deal with um, knocking the enemies down. So go to the trap door trap, open it up. And then when we trigger the trap, instead of, um, well, doing our trigger trap and setting all the enemies to dead, actually, this should probably be a spike trap. Um, what we want to do is set the enemies to um, fall. So let's uh, change this up a little bit. Let's make a new trap script and let's do a little bit of inheritance and abstraction. So I've got a trap here and when it should toggle and then the toggling should trigger the trap and then the triggering should do something. But what the trigger does should probably be somewhat abstracted. And I want to set up a spike trap and a um, trap door trap or door trap. Let's call them both of those. So I'm going to change this up. I'm going to make this an abstract class. No, I'm not going to make it abstract. Yeah, I am. I'm going to. No, I'm not. I'm de deciding. Ah, up in the air. I'm not going to make it abstract, but I am going to inherit from it. So I'm going to say public class spike trap, and I'll make a trap as the base class. Now, the reason for this, I'm going to take this trigger trap method, and I'm going to make this, well, I'm, first I'm going to copy it. Select the whole bit of code here, copy it. And then I'm going to make this virtual, and then I'm going to delete out the implementation. So now I've got a virtual void trigger trap that doesn't do anything by default on the trap. I'm going to go up to my spike trap and I'm going to say override and then I'll put in my trigger trap method and then I'll just paste in the code for trigger trap. There we go. So right now I've got a couple things going on. I've got a class that's inheriting from my trap that's going to override my trigger trap and an error message here saying that enemies is not accessible. Reason for that is that enemies is not protected. It needs to be protected or public to be accessible from a subclass. So I can change this to protected. And suddenly my error message is going to go away. I'm going to move my spike trap to its own file. So I hit move to spike trap.cs. And then I'm going to create a door trap. And then you're going to see why I did all of this. Because it doesn't make any sense until you see the second part. So let's go up here and let's create another trap. Say public class door trap. We'll make that inherit from trap as well. And then we're going to say override trigger trap. And then in here, I want to loop through my enemies and I don't want to kill them. I want to make them fall. So I'm going to say for each bar enemy in enemies, enemy dot fall. Simple enough. I'll move my door trap to its own file, hit control shift B and get my build error and then go to that file and fix the error message. So let's see. Oh, there's my error list. I'll double click on the error. We need to generate a fall method in our enemy. So it's not going to work until I create a fall method. So I'll generate that with alt enter. Hit enter F12 to oh, F. Try that again. Alt enter, generate a method F12, and it's not going to it. So let's just go to the enemy and see it. So I'll go over to my enemy and let's see if I can add in the fall method. For some reason, it's not generating my fall method. Okay, so we'll just create a fall method on our enemy script here. So what I'm going to do is instead of dying, I want to make the enemy fall down to die. So to do that, we're really not going to do a whole lot different. It's essentially the same as dying, I think. But um, is, it, is it the same as dying just without a launch velocity? Let me think about it for just a second. It is. So what I'm going to do is go back and I'm not going to add in a new script. I'll just say die and we'll pass in a vector 3.0. So we just won't give it any... Um, any velocity at all. Oh, I'm missing using statements, a using Unity engine statement. That's why it wasn't generating. It wasn't finding my enemy. It wasn't finding things because the using statement was gone. Okay, so um, now I'm thinking, hey, maybe my door trap code is a little over complicated because now the only difference is what, what the vector I'm passing in here is. 
Oh, maybe I need to switch it back. Maybe I should um, refactor them into a single class again. But I'm thinking that it probably is going to make sense to have some inheritance here and have some separation. Perhaps not, though. We'll see, though. Let's hit um, play and see if this works. So what I expect is that my enemies should walk into there. If the trap triggers, it should force it to animate, and then they should fall down and die. Let's see if it's actually the case, though. Oh, so there's an issue. The issue here is that if the trap is open, the um enemies don't fall, right? <laughs> like they they don't fall if they're in it at all. So what we can do is change this to um. Let me see. I guess it would have to be like an on. Oh wait, you know what? We also need to add make the body fall too. Here, let's let's do something real quick. I'm gonna take a couple of these floor components, disable them, and I'm gonna put a couple of these traps next to each other so we can see what's actually happening there. Um, and then we'll see that I think what I expect to happen is when an enemy is over one, if it does the trigger, it should actually start to fall. Oh, interestingly, it did not, which is a little bit confusing. Why did it not fall? So this trap door has it set up. I'm gonna just watch as watch the enemies. I expect the enemy count to go up once that guy walks into it. Okay, and then if I hit trigger trap, it, I, oh, 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 sorry, I see the problem. This is what happens when you go around changing classes. So I swapped out the class. I left that trap class in here. The trap class is not abstract and it allows me to do it, allows me to put it in here. But when I toggle the trap and I actually trigger it, it doesn't do anything now. So we'll say um, debug.log error. Um, no implementation. So right now I'm doing nothing and not even warning myself about it. So now I'll just log out a little error to say, hey, you're not doing anything, dummy. You should probably fix this. So let's fix it real quick by swapping out the trap script. So right here on my trap door, I'm gonna go assign the trap door script. So I'll go to my prefabs folder, let's find the, um, oh, let's find the spike trap first. Let's assign the spike trap here. So I'll take my trap script, click on it, go select it and just reassign the spike trap script instead. We'll remove the trap. And then we'll do the trap door as well. So we're gonna turn the trap door into a prefab. We'll go into the prefabs folder, drag it down here, make it an original prefab, rename it to trap door with a space so that I know it's mine. Remove the trap script and add a trap door script, or I think I named it door trap script. There we go. Now I'm gonna delete out my trap doors that I have already. Let's drag in this fresh one right here set its position up and let's get this position right. Duplicate, duplicate, duplicate and play. Now I expect to see that it should at least drop when the enemy is there, but I think it's probably not gonna fall because the is kinematic still on, right? Oh, nope, there we go. He falls and he actually dies. You can see the enemy is actually falling down and dying. Oh, I think it's, yeah, it kind of works. So let's make it so that we can place these traps now. Um, the next step for that is going to be, I guess, just setting them up as a placeable object and then making it so that when we place the trap, it turns off those tiles on the ground. So let's delete out these trap doors that are placed. We'll go to the player. It looks like we're only three likes away from 700. Once we hit 700, I'll start getting set up to give away that code so that everybody can go in and get the uh, art pack. There's 14 different art assets, um, 14 different characters, really cool stuff. And Whoever uh, is quick with it will we'll be able to get it for free. And like I like it. It's a cool pack. So, okay, we've got the spike trap assigned. I'm going to assign the trap door as number three. Save that off. I'm going to hit play. Let's watch what happens real quick. Um, oh, you know what? I might not even have to do much with, uh, with these positions now that I think about it. So let me put down some blocks real quick. Get these all positioned out so that we have the, the ground actually working. And then we'll hit play. I'm gonna hit three and then drop down a trap. So hit play three and drop down a trap. And you see, it actually dropped one there. But it's really hard to see because it actually left that block there. So let's actually make it so that the block does turn off. So when I place that trap with our trap placer script, there we go. Let's um, make it so that the ground piece turns off. And we'll do the giveaway thing in just a second once we finish this little trap. Let's get that going. So when we spawn the trap, what I want it to do is on this trap spawning, um, maybe just have it turn off its parent. Actually, you know what? 
I just have it turn off its parent collider and its parent renderer if it's that um the uh trap the door trap. Yeah, hey, why not? let's do that. So we'll say on enable. Um let's see, bar parent equals transform dot parent. And then we'll say, well actually here we'll just say transform dot parent dot get component collider dot enabled equals false. And then we'll do the same for the renderer. Um, I think that's it, right? So let, let's try that. That should just disable our renderer on enable. I think that's not gonna happen. Let's see. We go to three, we right click, we drop it out. But I think, um, here, let's look right here. The error that we're gonna get is that we're gonna spawn this. We're gonna actually call our on enable before we set our parent. So we need to do this a little bit later. Let's just do it. Um, Let's let's make a method. Let's say uh spawn. Actually, no. Let's do this. Watch this. We'll do an i enumerator return no. Did I spell that right? Let's see. We'll wait a frame and then do it. So we'll wait until we've already assigned it. We've moved it to our child, and then we'll we'll do the uh, toggling. So hit three, right click, bam. There we go. So the reason that that worked, just for everybody to clarify real quick is that if we add I enumerator here as our return type for start, we can actually use it like a coroutine. So I can do the yield return null statement here to wait one frame after our spawn happens. So what happens is our object spawns, code comes in here, calls this, and then later on we've set the parent, we move the parent, and then the next frame this resumes and it actually gets that parent object and turns those off. So now our door trap turns the, the parent off, Nothing else does, and our code doesn't have to be too smart about it. The trap can really handle it. Um, I think that kind of handles it, right? Let's see. I'm gonna go through and place a couple traps. So got a spike trap. I'm gonna place one of these traps. Place out a door trap, maybe another door trap, and a spike trap. I'm gonna run around, knock some dudes off the edge. See if I can watch some guys fall, fall to their death, or get launched up and stuff. I think I've got um a good chunk of the functionality done. So I'm gonna jump over to giving away that code in just a second so that everybody who's interested in it has a chance to grab it. And then um, I'll probably start wrapping this up and then maybe do some more of these later, maybe build on this and build out some levels and waves and different camera views and stuff. But right now we've got a lot of the different functionality, the traps placing, the enemies. Um, we just need like resources and health and stuff, but those are really common and, and about the same for just about everything. So if you're interested in getting the um, the pack, let me just make sure that you know how to get it so that everybody has an opportunity to grab it. It's just this low poly monster pack right here. Um, you can see it. It's got a, a bunch of cool stuff in it. Um, I don't know how, how else to explain it. There's just lots of cool stuff. Like I said, I got an extra code for it. So I figured I'd we'll give it away on the stream and see somebody else can grab it and use it for their stuff. So I'm gonna give out the code in just a little bit. I'll put it on the screen. So go ahead and get up the redemption page um, to, to redeem a Unity code. Um, and then whoever types it in fastest, I guess we'll, we'll grab the thing. I don't know. Um, so I'll give it a second. I'm gonna um, just pull, pull up the, uh, see if I can pull up that, that page for redeeming it too. There's a, there's a code or, asset redemption page somewhere on there there's a page everybody go find the asset store redemption thing if you if you want to find it right now or if you want to put in the code and i'll give you the code in just a second so i'm going to give it like two minutes everybody go ahead and find it pull it up and have it ready so they can type it in and then i'll just do a quick countdown i'll flash it on the screen and somebody else can uh somebody can go in and grab it um while, while everybody is doing that, I'll just sit here and blab for another second about um, other stuff. Looks like I had an error message. What was that about? An error message on probably a dead target is my guess. Yep, target was dead. And I wasn't checking. So we'll say, hey, if the target is null, then we're not ready to attack. We'll return false. There we go. Error message fixed or error fixed, bug fixed. All right, so... Um, Everybody go ahead and I guess just keep getting ready for that link. Hopefully everybody has got it figured out by now. If you're ready to put it in, just go ahead and say that you're ready in chat. And once I see like a page of people say that they're ready in chat, 
then we'll start and i'll just uh flash that sucker up there also um if you guys are interested in just these kinds of streams i think i might just kind of make them somewhat regular and just do them maybe weekly every saturday go through different game types just build out different stuff um maybe expand out some of them across a couple different days um in addition to just regular youtube videos plan on doing like some heavily edited ones of this stuff too but if uh, people really like the live streams, because I have a blast doing them and they seem like they're relatively popular, um, I'll keep doing them as well. So just let me know. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and share and all that stuff, though, because if the streams don't get a lot of views, then i am switch to another stuff. But so far, it seems like they're relatively popular and they're going pretty well. It looks like a lot of people are starting to say they're ready. Um, let me get ready in just one second and start to get ready to flash up the code. So again, the code is just like one time thing. You'll grab it and then. Um, once you redeem it, it was a little bit different. Like you redeem it and then all of the other packs become available in your thing. So you have to go redeem them individually. So it was, it was a little bit different. It confused me at first, but note to whoever whoever wins it and gets it, um, that, that's how you use it. It's a really cool pack. So um, thanks again for the, the freebie and letting me give this thing out. All right. Um, I'm going to drag it over in like three. And, well, I'll drag it over in like 10 seconds. And then everybody can start typing and see if they can get it. And yeah, congrats to whoever does. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, terrible countdown, 1. All right, there's the code. Whoever can grab it first, uh, congrats. Redeem it. Enjoy. I hope you like it. Um, I hope it's helpful and you can make some cool stuff with it. Um, again, thanks again, everybody, for coming out. And I guess... um. I don't know if I had anything else to say. I think I just kind of wanted to wrap it up there. I just wanted to say thanks again, everybody, for, for watching and subscribing. Also, the code um, uh, is going to be available down below on the link. I'll go update it. Um, in fact, let's go update it right now while everybody goes through and congratulates whoever won or whoever got that code. And uh, we'll put it up in here so that everybody else can at least win with uh, the source code for all this stuff and use it in their own project. So let's see. Let's update the player script. Player is updated. We'll take the flag script. Make sure that's updated. Actually, I haven't touched the flag script, so that's not going to change at all. Same with the spawner script. Hasn't changed, but we've got a door trap here, so we'll add that in. Door trap.cs. And then we'll add in the blade trap.cs. So I'm copying this. So just adding these all in right here on this uh on this gist. So we'll add in the blade trap. And then we need to get the actual trap file updated. So copy that whole thing. Again, it's just control A, by the way, to copy or select a whole file and grab it. Um, hopefully somebody won. Um, oh, cool. Somebody, look, somebody has claimed it. Awesome. Congrats. Hopefully you really like it and it's, it's super useful for you. Um, let's see. Oh, I got to add in the trap script. So add in trap, paste it right here. Trap.cs. And then I don't have the trap placer script. So I'll put that in. Trap placer. In fact, watch this. Go up here, copy, double click, copy, paste, and dot CS. All right, anything else? Um, let me just make sure that the player script is updated. I'm pretty sure it was, but I want to make sure because it would suck if it wasn't. There's the player script, and then um, is there anything else? Oh, the enemy. Let's just double check that the enemy is good too. Paste that in, and we're good to go. So now the whole gist should be updated with all of the code, so you can go grab that as well, and then um, yeah, have fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming out. Again, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and tell all your friends about this stuff. And uh, if you have other suggestions, ideas, recommendations for streams you want to see in the future, just let me know. Drop a comment down below. Uh, be happy to hear them. I got quite a few good ideas coming up that people recommended. This was just one of them that I really liked. So we'll keep going with that. And um, yep, that's all. Thanks again, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. Really appreciate it. And uh, I think I'm out of stuff to say and starting to run out of breath. So.